Good morning, everyone. Uh, call to order the meeting of the University of Wisconsin System Board of Regents. Would the secretary please read the roll? Here. Here. Receive the minutes of our June 5th and uh, June 6th meetings. Are there any questions or additions, corrections to the minutes? If not, is there a motion to approve them? So moved. Is there a second? All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed? Minutes are approved. I'd like to begin my report by just uh, pointing out uh, a little transition that we have here. It's very delightful. Uh, you all know that President Riley and all the chancellors have these uh, elaborate staffs that help them get all of their work done. <laughs> <laughs> and the Board of Regents struggles along with a very, very small and very capable staff, I might add. And we have one of our Board of Regents staff members who will be leaving us and pursuing his higher education in order to do his part to contribute to the growth agenda for Wisconsin. Uh, Holden, would you please stand? <laughs> Holden Weissman has uh, been with us for over two years, and he's, he's had the job as program assistant for the board. He's going to be starting his graduate studies at UW-Madison at the Robert LaFollette School of Public Affairs. So why don't you join me in hoping, wishing Holden a successful career in his academic pursuits, and thank you. <laughs> Good job, Holden. We appreciate your service. Can I add, President Bradley, that, that Regent Thomas, who's also starting her graduate study at LaFalle, has agreed to be a study buddy of Holden. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would like to call on President Riley to um, make an introduction. Thank you. Well, and good morning, everybody. Good to see you again. Uh, I wanted to take this opportunity uh, to welcome a special guest who's with us today. It's uh, Mr. Jim Ron, who is the president of the Kern Family Foundation. Uh, that foundation, the Kern Family Foundation, which is based in Waukesha, leads and financially supports efforts to get more science, technology, engineering, and mathematics education, the STEM disciplines that we're also uh, focused on and concerned about, into Wisconsin's middle and high schools. Uh, clearly, uh, that effort uh, is very much in sync with our growth agenda for Wisconsin objectives, which is why I'm very pleased to have uh, Jim joining us here today. The foundation is investing its support in an innovative curriculum called Project Lead the Way, which is designed to help students build the necessary skills to prepare them for the high-wage, high-tech, 21st century careers we want them to have. Over this past summer, the current foundation teamed up with 4-H and UW Extension's Cooperative Extension Division to offer Project Lead the Way Gateway Academies geared to middle schoolers. So Jim joins us here today as we share the exciting news that for the first time, students applying to UW campuses may have one or more of their Project Lead the Way courses count toward their three science units required for admission. Ten UW institutions have agreed to count these courses that way so far, and three others are in the final stages of their review process now. Uh, we all know, I think, that our state faces very, very big challenges in creating the brain trust we need in the important areas of science, technology, engineering, and math. And I might add that as we looked at this issue in our engineering uh, task force study, one of the things we found was that uh, a big part of the problem of that we hear about from employers, uh, companies saying we don't have enough people to hire. We can't get enough engineers. We can't get the kinds of engineers we want for our company. It is a pipeline issue. Uh, a number of our existing engineering programs have empty seats. 
Uh, the problem is we can't get students who are well prepared and able to take on that challenging curriculum. So uh, we all recognize, I think, that we need to work long term on the pipeline in STEM and the work uh, that Kern is doing there and that we're doing are, are very much of a piece in attacking what really is the, the core of, of the issue. So uh, thanks to the vision and support of the Kern Family Foundation and President Ron, uh, our collaborative efforts together with UW, more students will, will get the uh, kinds of uh, training, background, education they need to meet challenges in the STEM curriculum that, that lie before them with confidence and success. So to tell us a little more about this, it's my pleasure to introduce to the board and others here, uh, Mr. Jim Ron, the president of the Kern Foundation. Jim. Uh, thank you, President Riley, for this opportunity to address the board and for your many kind words about the work of the foundation. I'll be sure to pass those on to Robert and Patricia Kern, the benefactors of the foundation, when we return. Uh, the pipeline issue to which the President referred <coughs> is one that uh, the Kerns experienced over 54 years and is one that uh, led to some of the passion behind the programming and the vision at the Kern Family Foundation. Uh, Robert Kern is an entrepreneur and an engineer who created and ran Generac Power Systems in Waukesha, Wisconsin between 1954 when the company was founded and 2008 when he sold the business and retired. His greatest challenge, which he speaks to the staff frequently about, was the, the, the challenge he had in finding the talent necessary to meet the technical needs of Generax worldwide customers and to find the creative, innovative talent necessary to make and maintain Generac as a leading supplier and innovator in power systems around the world. So when he and Mrs. Kern began the Kern Family Foundation, their, their interest in education was a big part of it. And as they looked at what could be a key program initiative for them and something that would really uh, partner with others to meet the needs of the state, it was to assist students young people in developing their science, technology, engineering, and mathematics uh, talent with the goal of increasing the pipeline of highly skilled workers for the 21st century workforce. I can't emphasize enough how thrilled we are at the foundation at the partnership with the UW system and with their participating campuses in that they realize clearly the importance of creating a pipeline for students of participated in the Project Lead the Way high school programs and are now entering the UW system and by doing this through offering the admissions credit to which President Riley re referred. Truly, the UW system and the leadership of this Board of Regents is leading the country in this regard and we hope that this can be a catalyst for other states as well and we thank you for that. We're particularly deeply grateful for the leadership that has been displayed and the innovative work that were done by President Riley, Regent Danae Davis, Regent and Superintendent Elizabeth Burmaster, and of course uh, UW Colleges and Extension Chancellor David Wilson. Our sincere thanks to all of them. In addition, this partnership grew this year as for the first time the Kern Family Foundation joined a partnership with 4-H which is a program of the UW Extensions Division of Cooperative Extension to support Project Lead the Way Gateway Academy summer camps in nine communities across Wisconsin, including Appleton, Eagle River, Eau Claire, La Crosse, Madison, Platteville, Plymouth, Prairie du, Prairie du Chien, and Racine. These Gateway Academies help over 140 young people develop both their excitement and success in science, technology, engineering, and math. And we look forward to that program growing even larger uh, next summer. The Kern Family Foundation, the UW System, UW Extension's 4-H program, and schools throughout the state of Wisconsin are teaming up to face a real and imminent economic challenge 
And they're doing that by preparing more students to become tomorrow's innovators, engineers, scientists, and inventors. The vigilant focus we all share on STEM initiatives, we believe, will keep Wisconsin competitive in the growing global com uh, community. I thank you again for your partnership, the work, the innovation, and the vision we share. And I thank you for this opportunity to address you today. Thank you, President Ron, and we look forward to working with you in, in the future on our shared interests. Back to you, President Brett. Good. Thank you. And thank you, Ron. I'd like to call on Regent Connolly Keesler to present the resolution. I'm sorry. <laughs> the award? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a resolution of appreciation. Okay. All right, good morning. <laughs> I need more of my caffeine this morning. Um, I wish you all had the opportunity to read the applications that we get in for these awards. It is um, spectacular. Are we on the awards? You're looking at me funny. Well, I'm, I'm sorry. I should have been more clear about the resolution of appreciation for Chancellor Keating. <laughs> Okay, Re Regent Conley Keith, so Regent Vasquez just asked how many applications there were for that <laughs> resolution of appreciation for Chancellor Keating. Well, you may know we're having a hard time in that particular area of <laughs> replacement. <laughs> okay, let's start again, Jack. <laughs> a hard guy to replace. It is my honor to stand here before you to read this, um, this uh, resolution for uh, Chancellor John Keating. Whereas, and these are all the whereases, whereas John P. Jack Keating dedicated more than 10 years of service as the fifth chancellor of the University of Wisconsin Parkside from 1998 to 2008, and whereas Jack's leadership has grown campus enrollment to 5,000 students and in the process has established UW Parkside as the most diverse institution within the UW system. And whereas, through his commitment to developing academic and professional excellence, Jack piloted efforts to re-emphasize the value of, of facility research and establish international student and facility exchange agreements. And whereas Jack initiated growth strategies to improve campus infrastructure, which included an expansion of the Sports and Activity Center, a multi-million dollar project to expand the Student Union and Communication Arts Building, and the construction of the new residence hall. And whereas he encouraged UW Parkside to engage with the community by creating civic partnerships and collaborating with schools, community leaders, local organizations, most notably through the Center for Community Partnerships, and the Wisconsin Campus Compact, and the creation of the Dean for Community Engagement and Civic Learning Positions, and whereas Jack has, has developed UW Parkside into a mechanism of economic development for Southeast Wisconsin, harnessing the resources of the institution to serve the unique needs and the priorities of the local business and community. Be it therefore resolved that the Board of Regents of the University of Wisconsin system hereby thanks and commendations to John P. Keating for his many years of life achievements and for his service as Chancellor of UW Parkside. Thanks, Jack. Chancellor Parkside, I wasn't sure I was going to be honored today or not. <laughs> uh, I was supposed to be honored, uh, I think, in July, uh, but you know what happened? I just maneuvered because you didn't need it in July, so I wanted to stay in place until 
You can honor me in one of your meetings. Uh, but my true thanks uh, for everything uh, since I've been at Farside for 10 years. When I came to the campus, I told them I was going to be their new, camp, uh, their, their new chancellor for 10 years. Uh, that's so that you can always beg forgiveness because you didn't know any better, and that was a lot easier when you made mistakes. But the 10 years were up, and so I had to do something, so moving on was the question. When I came here for the weather uh, from Alaska, and, uh, and prior to that from the real UW, uh, you all moan usually when I say that. That's the University of Washington, unless you can get it. Uh, I basically, I think, had one friend in the whole state, uh, Tom George, who you all knew. I knew him from uh, the state of Washington. Uh, and now that I'm leaving, I consider I have hundreds and even thousands of friends uh, in the state of the great state of Wisconsin. Uh, I've enjoyed my time there, and I've really enjoyed the Board of Regents' uh, individual efforts. Uh, you, uh, as Board of Regents, spend innumerable hours uh, basically at this task. And I've seen various uh, political strikes among you. Uh, obviously, there's been a whole transformation of the political party at the table. Uh, but the value for education has been consistent. It's been a constant. And uh, you all basically, you work hard to have that constant the foremost in all your uh, deliberations, and some of them very hard deliberations. Uh, the other thing that I basically value with the Board of Regents is the fact that they recognize each campus as a unique entity. Uh, it was very critical that that be the case. Obviously, our campus is different than Madison. Our campus is different than Oshkosh. Our campus is different than every other campus, as every other campus is different from each other. And that's an important uh, quality, I think, an important strength of the University of Wisconsin system. It's basically a system that tries to serve all citizens of the state in the way they should be served. Uh, I basically also want to thank uh, especially my colleagues, the chancellors, who uh, we learned how to sit there quietly. When I first came, in fact, we used to sit there totally quietly. And then some of us had heard things that we just didn't uh, think were correct. And so we had to jump out of our seat every now and then. And I'm glad to see now that usually we do get recognized when we have something to say. But the chances have been terrific. Uh, I've seen a lot of change. I remember there's only three old guys that still are around. Uh, but most of them are new uh, since uh, I came here. And uh, basically what the chances always try to do is come to consensus on any strong policy that affects the entire system. That's critical, I think. And when I talk to our colleagues who have left the system for other systems, they say that they remember the differences in their meetings at the other systems and at the uh, UW system. One is uh, basically a lot of cooperation and consensus building, and the other is that they are facing now is a lot of fights and figuring out exactly who's going to get what penny. I remember when I first came here, uh, we had some differences with uh, an office up here at the, uh, surprisingly, uh, with an office up here at the system. And uh, the person that was leading the differences had just come to our campus from New York. And so I came up here and George Brooks was the person I was talking to. And he said, you know, where's the person from? I said, from New York. He said, well, that explains it. <laughs> he said, you don't understand the Wisconsin system. That the system's here to help. It's really here to help the campuses as opposed to do what other systems do is basically make sure that they control the campuses. And that, I think, is a really value that you should make sure that it remains in place. That the campuses, and I like to tell this to my friends around the country, are semi-autonomous. And that sounds like we're like liberated, and it's true. We're liberated to do what we do best because we know what is best for the campus, uh, sometimes at least, and we really try to put in place what we think is best, and you trust that. And that trust is critical for the proper functioning of any system, that we're a federation, if you will, of campuses, each campus basically being uh, set in its own direction, and at the same time, you yourself have the overall oversight for the policy. And the less that you got into the diddly little bits of pieces on the campus, the better and stronger the system <coughs> is. So again, I'm just uh, here to say thank you. Thank you to the Board of Regents, first of all, for giving me the chance to uh, serve as the 
Chancellor at Parkside, a terrific campus. I think you all saw that last year, and a unique campus, a campus that serves a unique population in the state that needs serving. I want to thank the, my colleagues, the chancellors, uh, who universally I respect, and basically we uh, do come to consensus over the critical policy issues, and that's important. I want to thank those members of the system who really serve us, as uh, George told me early on, serve us in a, a variety of ways. Unfortunately, I've had a lot of dealings with the legal office. <laughs> <laughs> but even there, they don't act like real attorneys. <laughs> but, uh, each of the system people really do go out of their way to give us their very best. Uh, and this, basically, I'm sure my colleagues can, can also say thank you and thank you very much. And I'd like to thank my wife, who's not here, but most of you know her. I think all of you know her. Uh, and if she was here, she'd tell you the truth. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, I'd like to say so long. We'll be seeing you around. I'm not going too far, but thank you for everything you've done and give me the privilege to do. Thank you. Thank you, Regent Conley. He's the. Is she up again? No. no. <laughs> and now I'd like to call upon Regent David Walsh to present a resolution of appreciation for Chancellor Wyatt. May it please the court. You notice that Chancellor Keating did not say real Irish attorneys. <laughs> There's a difference. Uh, good morning. Um, before I read this resolution, I'd like to make a couple comments. And if the president doesn't want me to, I'm still going to make a couple comments. John Wiley arrived on this campus in 1964, a time that I was heading off to the Navy. And he, got, he received his Ph.D. in 1968, I believe. Yes. He went off to AT&T and Bell Labs, the real world, the industrial research world, and he returned in 1975. And he has been on this campus since that day. In 1989, he was appointed the dean of the graduate school. Now, that's 20 years to the day. And for 20 years, John Wiley has been in positions of leadership, first as dean of the graduate school, then as provost under David Ward, and as chancellor since 2001. And he indeed has left a legacy to this university and to this state. And at first blush, might, one might say that it's in the buildings. You look around, you see the cranes. Certainly, he was very much a part of that. He was on a management team for 20 years, the same management team 
starting as graduate dean and then provost and chancellor. And John Wiley, being the engineer, had something to say about the design of the master plan, the infrastructure, and he has executed on that plan. We have $1.75 billion worth of new buildings under his tenure as chancellor, of which he raised $757 million for those buildings. A tremendous challenge today. He also didn't take care of just the science buildings, the Wisconsin Institute for Discovery, Microbial, the Interdisciplinary Research Center, Tower 1, Tower 2, where we'll now have one of the great health science centers in the world. Um, he didn't just do that, but he looked to the East Campus for art. We're going to approve the Chazen Museum today. Um, hopefully soon the music school will have a new school, because John cares about more than just science. But what I wanted to mention, what I think his legacy is, is, is a leader in the message. And, and to me, I've heard two messages from John over the last eight years. The first message has to do with research. And I repeat some statistics that he talked about, often to alumni centers. I hope that's not me. I, I just got a new phone. I don't know how to turn it off. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin, the Irish don't know anything about this stuff. I have a new car, a new iPhone. I have no idea how to turn it off. Speaking of technology. <laughs> I forgot where I was, but I'll just, I'll just continue from there. Um, Yes, research. <laughs> this is on the fly. Uh, John has often said to alumni groups that there are approximately 12,000 universities in this world, of which 4,000, about 4,000, are in this country. Now, of those 4,000, 600 to 650 do research. And of those 600 to 650, 20 of them do 53% of the research. That's 20 universities out of 14,000 universities in the world. And of those 20, the University of Wisconsin-Madison has been in the top five every year that John can recall. And sometimes number two, sometimes number one. Strike right, John's top in this classified research we don't count it. But, but that's the success of this university. And with that comes a new reality of a new day. And that is that we don't have industrial research anymore. The Bell Labs aren't doing what Bell Labs did when John was there. Instead, universities are doing the research. And they're training and preparing the faculties of the future, but likewise developing the new economy. And out of the University of Wisconsin-Madison has come 385 new businesses. Now, this is statistics and figures, but the, what the point is is that John Wiley has been taking this message to the people, to the alumni, to the business people around the country, and that is part of his legacy. He's getting through to people so that they understand the importance of higher education, and in particular, our university system in Wisconsin. The second message that I think is part of his legacy is that John Wiley politely reminded the world five years ago that those states with higher per capita income have a greater percentage of baccalaureate degree holders, and when you have higher per capita income, you have more tax revenue, and you can invest in a better quality of life. And that is a message that we took as a board, and Kevin Riley and his growth agenda, and we got constituencies to agree with us. The business people, the chancellors all over the state went to the people in their neighborhoods, and we've got full support for our last growth agenda. And I credit John Wiley for starting that discussion. And finally, I also credit John Wiley for continuing that discussion. You probably all saw the headlines in the paper today. The point is, is that John Wiley's not going away. John Wiley is going to continue the discussion. And one of the great legacies is that he has started a public dialogue about the future of higher education in Wisconsin. He has started it. He has argued it. And it is now our responsibility to make sure that everyone is engaged in it. And that's the new graduates when they graduate. Tell them to listen. Tell them to get involved. It's all of you in this room. We've done a good job. It's the press and it's the media. And we wouldn't be there but to the leadership of John Wiley and Kevin Riley. 
And that's part of the legacy I talk about when I talk about John Wiley. Now, one last thing. I was asked by a newspaper reporter if I had anything funny to say about John, and I don't. Because he's, <laughs> he's not the funniest guy in the world. <laughs> but I do recall one thing he said to me early on when I was acting like a lawyer. And he said, 72.87% of all statistics are made up on the spot. <laughs> And I have used that in court, and I didn't win, but the judge laughed. <laughs> Thank you very much. Now, I'm going to read the resolution. <clears throat> Whereas, John D. Wiley served as the chancellor of the University of Wisconsin-Madison from 2001 to 2008, a culmination of more than 30 years of service at the institution. And whereas, he worked to keep the university accessible and affordable, advocating for additional need-based scholarships and establishing a number of transfer programs to provide more avenues for students to access the UW Madison education. And whereas, John Wiley has steadfastly supported and expanded research efforts that help to sustain UW Madison's reputation as a world-class institution, including the creation of the Wisconsin Institutes of Discovery and the Great Lakes Bioenergy Research Center, and whereas John led in the creation of a master plan to guide campus facilities and infrastructure for the incoming decades and oversaw a period of tremendous growth, such as the opening of a new health science learning center, the West Campus cogeneration facility, the microbial science building, and the revitalization of the Southeast Campus region, and whereas, through his leadership in the creation of the East Campus Mall, the development of an arts and humanities district, and his support for arts programs, including the Chazen Museum of Art, John has been an unwavering advocate for the arts on the UW-Madison campus, and whereas, under John's guidance, UW-Madison has forged vital partnerships, such as the Wisconsin Partnership Fund for a Healthy Future and the Historic Transfer Agreement with the College of the Menominee Nation, and has maintained mutually beneficial relationships with the state's business community, and whereas he worked tirelessly to develop additional sources of philanthropic support for the university, including spearheading a successful $1.5 billion to the Create the Future Capital Campaign and encouraging numerous substantial private donations. Be it therefore resolved that the Board of Regents of the University of Wisconsin System hereby offer thanks and commendation to John Wiley for his many life achievements and for his service as Chancellor of University of Wisconsin-Madison. Jack and then David used up all my lines. <laughs> so I'll, uh, I'll try not to be redundant and I'll, and I'll definitely be brief. I couldn't agree more with uh, the things Jack said about uh, this system. I got around and see a lot of universities, a lot of systems around the country, and this is un unambiguously the best one. Things just work in this system. It's due in large part to the things that, that Jack uh, affirmed for you, and so I, I'd like to join in the comments that he made about his fellow chancellors, my fellow chancellors, all the boards I've worked with. You know, Tommy Thompson used to say, after he appointed regents, that he appointed them to come up here and clean up that mess in the university, and then they went native on him. <laughs> I think it's very telling that the people who spend some time to learn about the details of what goes on here go back and say, Governor, you were wrong. It's not a mess. It's functioning pretty well. And I wish that message uh, would get out, and actually it does, from former regents that I meet all around the state. Uh, nobody, I'm sure, wakes up at age 8 or 10 or whatever and says, someday I'd like to be a dean or a provost or a chancellor. And I was no exception. Uh, I wanted to be a scientist and eventually maybe a professor. So uh, this is not a career that I expected to have for 20 years. And I can tell you I'm really looking forward to getting back to at least one of those that I 
that I intended to have, including teaching at the La Palla Institute. One of my faculty sent me a seamstress measuring tape a few months ago. It said that it's a tradition in the Czech Army when you become a short-timer to carry that tape around and trim off one centimeter a day to count down. <laughs> <laughs> this is what I have left of it. <laughs> if I could read just one serious message with the board, since this is probably the last time I'll be addressing you, certainly the last time as chancellor. Um, I think it's unfortunate that the state and, and regents treat tuition and state support separately. The legislature seldom thinks about them together at the same time. The regents don't either. When we talk about tuition, we usually focus on uh, incremental changes. How much will the increase be next year, or should we increase it at all? The really important public policy issue, I think, that the whole country needs to, to focus on is answering a very simple question that I think will be difficult to answer. And that is, who should pay for these commodities that we, that we produce, these degrees? Let me just focus on bachelor's degrees. A bachelor's degree from UW-Madison is worth something on the order of half a million dollars on the day you take it in your hand in discounted current net present value. So who should pay for that? That's what it's worth to the holder of the degree. It's also worth something to the state. We have to ask, how much is it worth to the state of Wisconsin to produce that one degree in terms of future tax revenues, reduced impact on the health care system, reduced impact on the prison system, and all the other benefits that are disproportionately flowing to people who hold uh, degrees beyond high school? How much is it worth to the state? And how much is it worth to the individual? And who should pay for what fraction? That's the real question. They should always be treated and thought of together. Historically in Wisconsin, we've told ourselves that the deal we have with the state is that the state pays two thirds of the cost of education, the students pay one third. It's been a long time since that was even close to true. It's more like 50-50 now. I don't know what the right balance is. I don't know if two thirds, one third is right. I don't know how that was ever arrived at. I don't think there was any rational analysis behind it. I don't know if 50-50 is the right answer. I don't know if one-third, two-thirds is the right answer. But that is the right question. And that's the debate we should be having. We should be trying to figure out, for the good of the state, what fraction of that cost should the state pay? Because I can guarantee you the private school model, which is most of, the, most of those 4,000 universities in this country are private. They have a relatively large number of small privates and a small number of large publics. The private school model can't be scaled up to educate the fraction of the citizenry we want to educate. And so the, the one question I hope you keep coming back to and focusing on and urging the legislature to focus on is that balance between public support for public education and individual student and family uh, bills in the form of tuition. Thank you very much. It's been an honor to serve in this position, but I'm really happy to be going back to the faculty. <laughs> I uh, just add a word or two of my own about uh, John and, and Jack Keating. You know, they, from my point of view, these are uh, two uh, leaders who 
led their campuses with real uh, integrity and intelligence and, and zeal and the positive influence uh, of their leadership will be felt most directly on their own campuses for decades and decades to come and in the way we operate this system as a system, and I'm, I'm very grateful for that. I know I speak for all the chances of John when I say we'll miss having you around the table. We welcome uh, Biddy in your place, but we'll miss having you and we'll miss having, having Jack at the table as well. And uh, for myself, it's been my privilege to work with both of them and to learn from both of them about leadership, which, which I have. So thank you very much. Thank you, Kevin. Um, Judy, if you would let the record show that both of those resolutions were approved by acclamation. Thank you. You received the written report of the Wisconsin Technical College System Board. Are there any <coughs> questions or comments on that report? <coughs> uh, Regents Keene, Burmaster, Smith, and Vasquez uh, serve on that board. A couple of items to conclude uh, my report. Uh, yesterday, Kevin led a discussion on our biennial budget request for 2009 and 11, and I'd like to compliment Kevin and his staff for uh, presenting us in order that we might present the state with a, a budget that is in line with um, our principles and that ex as we express them through the growth agenda for Wisconsin. Um, as a board, I think it's uh, very important that our budget reflects what we're trying to talk about, what we're trying to do for the state, and I think this one uh, really hits the mark. Well prepared and well presented, so thank you. Speaking of the budget, <clears throat> we've had uh, numerous discussions uh, in, 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 uh, prior to yesterday's meeting to inform the governor and the governor's staff about where we're trying to go, what we're trying to accomplish for the state. Uh, Vice President Pruitt and President Riley and I met with the governor and some members of the staff. The, the budget was received as, uh, I think, was received as by people saying, we understand what you're trying to do. It's going to be difficult in the term, in terms of uh, state revenue. I mentioned yesterday that the governor said he was sticking by his January revenue estimates. Of course, there's a long time between now and, and the time that um, the budget actually gets passed. But I got the impression that there was a, an appreciation for uh, sticking with the governor's guidelines, which carved out some important exceptions for education, and also an appreciation for where we're trying to go as a solution to uh, where Wisconsin and what Wisconsin is trying to achieve. Following that meeting, uh, we also met with uh, legislative leadership from uh, both parties. We met with uh, Speaker Mike Hipsch, who was here yesterday. Um, Speaker Hipsch also wanted Representative Nass as chair of the Colleges and Universities Committee to be in on that meeting. And he also invited Senator Scott Fitzgerald, who attended the meeting. And again, I think this was well received in the context of GPR is going to be a big challenge, but we understand what you're trying to do, and we agree with uh, the goals of the growth agenda for Wisconsin. We then met with uh, Senator Decker, the majority leader, and he asked Senator Miller to be involved in that meeting. I think it went about the same. There's a, a real appreciation for what we're doing. And uh, President Riley then later met with Senator Weinhout, who's chair of the Senate Education Committee, and I believe you also met with Representative Schilling. Uh, some other meetings have been going on. Uh, Chancellor Telfer and Chancellor Gao hosted Representative Nas on their campuses, and uh, uh, Regent Opkenorth has been very busy, enthusiastically uh, meeting with representatives from his district and going to some campus functions. So, Kevin, we appreciate your efforts in that area. Uh, later this afternoon, I'm going to be meeting with uh, the state auditor, Jan Mueller, to talk about our, our audit responses and also uh, talk about the growth agenda and our, our budget request. Overall, I think these meetings have been uh, very constructive. On the federal level, we hope to continue the same kind of dialogue. In uh, early September, Kevin and I 
and uh, Chris Andrews, our federal legislative relations staff person, are going to Washington, D.C. This would be the, the third trip for me doing these kinds of meetings where we go around to the congressional delegation and talk about the many uh, ways that the federal government impacts on our funding and, and uh, what we're trying to achieve on our various campuses. Later today, we're going to take up, uh, you'll see on our agenda, the setting our calendar for this coming year. Last year, we uh, tried something at the request of a number of regents, and that is to set aside at least two days for in-depth discussions on big policy issues to get a, a good airing of them, not being under pressure to, to make a final decision and pass a resolution. I think that was successful last year. I've heard from another, a number of regions that it has been. So I would like to try that again for this year. And I would like to offer two big picture topics for us to tackle starting in November, giving a morning to one of them and an afternoon to the other. The first big one is um, what I call the, the graying of the faculty. A few years ago, we had a presentation alerting us to what was going on with the aging of our faculty and staff and projections of how many people on our campuses are going to be reaching an age of retirement. And that presents a, a, a huge challenge for us in terms of our uh, quality workforce to deliver our product. Uh, you know, just if you can consider this, over half of our faculty are now age 50 and over. And over one third of them, and that's, that's about 2,200 faculty members, are 55 and older. So we're going to have a lot of departures in our faculty and staff because of retirements. So we're going to have to consider what this uh, graying of the faculty is going to, how, what impact that's going to have for our duty to maintain access for students and also to preserve quality. A second big policy issue I would like to take up in November is this question of professional doctorates. Uh, those of you who have been on the board for a few years have, have seen the increasing requests that we have had come to us. Uh, these doctorates that are sometimes required by accrediting bodies, uh, they often result from uh, an outgrowth of master's degree programs. And they are different doctorates than the traditional research-based doctor that requires a dissertation, the, the PhD. We have uh, looked at the, the DBA, uh, that's a doctorate degree. Um, in also, we've looked at the, the ED for the education doctorate. And the projection is that we're going to see more of these types of requests. So I would like to have that as our second big picture topic in November. So that's the, the latest and greatest from what's been going on as uh, we wind up the summer. And I'd now like to turn it over to President Wright. Thank you very much, President Bradley. Uh, we were honoring two of our departing leaders, John and Jack. And, uh, I wanted to mention that uh, we spent some time on Wednesday meeting with uh, Regent Thomas and Regent Opka North with uh, some of our younger leaders, the student government leaders from around uh, the system and United Council as well. And a number of them were here yesterday. They met uh, on Wednesday, Wednesday night, and some of them came to the board meeting Thursday morning. I neglected to, to recognize them then, but I, uh, Regent Thomas reminded me I didn't want to, to fail to mention to you the, the great work uh, they do and, and how we look forward in uh, to working with all of them in this coming academic year. Some of them are newly elected. Some of them were student government leaders last year who are returning. So with our two student regents, we'll uh, be working with that group and be bringing you news from that work throughout throughout the coming year. And let me uh, recognize one other uh, departing colleague. Uh, today is the last regent meeting for Associate Vice President for Academic Affairs, Ron Singer, who has been with the UW system for 35 years, uh, first as a faculty member and then an administrator on the UW Parkside campus, and for the last seven years serving this 
Board and UW System Administration. So I want to thank him for all those years and say we'll, we'll miss his colleagueship and camaraderie and intelligence and enthusiasm, but we know he's got some good plans for retirement as well, so we'll let him go. Right. <laughs> I wanted to, uh, to mention that uh, uh, along the lines of some of President Bradley's remarks uh, about working uh, with the legislature, that, that earlier this week I had the opportunity to uh, testify before the Legislative Council's Committee on Building Wisconsin's Workforce. I did send copies of that testimony out around uh, the system for, for you to look at. Several of our colleagues uh, from uh, both system administration and campuses joined me in that to talk about some of the initiatives and efficiencies that we're embracing uh, here in the UW system. And our, I uh, made it clear that uh, we're a big part of, of building Wisconsin's workforce as we go forward. And I think there were uh, very interesting questions uh, uh, and, and a generally uh, good uh, feeling, if I can characterize it that way, about the work the university was doing in that regard. This, Legislative Council Committee is one that's made up of, of elected legislators, both uh, Senate and Assembly and public members as well. So it's, it's a mixed uh, mixed group, uh, and a very, it was a very good, good conversation. I'm sure we'll uh, have more of that conversation. Uh, out of these Legislative Council Committees can sometimes come suggestions for new legislation, uh, new bills. So we want to work with them throughout the year and see where, where all that might go, but the university will be in the middle of that. Uh, I also collaborated with uh, President Emeritus Catherine Lyle on a, uh, an op-ed on our leadership and accountability. I think you know that uh, both Minnesota and California have recently announced that in California, the University of California system, and uh, in Minnesota, the, uh, both MinSQ and uh, the University of Minnesota under the auspices of their coordinating board will be starting uh, to issue accountability reports. Well, we just thought we had to remind people that we've been doing that for 15 years and that uh, we were the first to do it as a system and that we are in the process now of revising our accountability indicators in order to make them more consonant with the goals of the growth agenda. And as I said yesterday, we'll be back to you uh, at your next meeting to talk some more about that. Um, I think at this point, I'll switch to a, a very uh, happy occasion. We have the opportunity this morning to salute some of the shining lights on our UW academic staff. Every year, the regents do this. Uh, you present awards of excellence to the academic staff, and these are the highest honors that the UW academic staff can, can achieve, and we have some very worthy recipients this year. Regent Eileen conley Keesler Chair of that committee, <laughs> as she did for the Jack Keating recognition. <laughs> no. And uh, and the other regents that worked with her were uh, Danae Davis, Kevin Opkenworth, Brent Smith, Jose Vasquez, and Betty Womack. So for more on the award winners, we'll turn it over to Eileen. <laughs> Thank you. It is with great pleasure that I welcome today's winners of the 2008 Academic Staff Regents Awards for Excellence. With this award, the Board of Regents of the UW System recognizes the dedicated work, the vital services, outstanding contributions of the UW System's academic staff. With the award, each recipient will receive a $5,000 stipend designated to support their professional development or other activities that will enhance the uni a university program or function. But before I introduce the uh, recipients, I want to tell you a little bit more about the award program. Each UW institution was invited to submit one nomination for the 2008 Academic Staff Region Awards for Excellence. And we used specific criteria when looking at those applications. And I wish you all had the opportunity to read those applications because they really are outstanding. And it's really a difficult decision to make when you're looking at them all and somehow they some higher being told us we only have three awards. <laughs> so we, we have to really narrow it down, and it, uh, it takes a lot of work to do that. But they are all great, 
and I wish that we were able to do awards for all of them. But we look at four specific things, excellence of performance, and this is performance that consistently and substantially exceeds in quality expectations for the position, has set superior standards for excellence, and has resulted in important and significant contributions to her, his department, and the institution. We look at personal interaction, performance that consistently and substantially demonstrates ability and willingness to work positively and effectively with, with others. We look at initiative and creativity, performance that consistently and substantially demonstrates an innovative approach to the job. And we look at outstanding achievement, and this is performance that consistently and substantially has resulted in important and significant contributions to the department unit and the university, and has resulted in distinction in one's profession, campus-wide, system-wide, state-wide, nationally, or internationally. So I know I speak for the regents on the committee in saying that we were impressed by the quality and achievements of all the nominees, and that it was hard to choose just three uh, when we believe all the nominees really represent an enormous accomplishment and commitment um, in, our, in the academic staff across the university system. And all nominees should take pride in having been nominated for this award. Their nominations acknowledge the value their institution places on the many contributions to the university system. And now Regent Smith will introduce our first. My pleasure to present the, our first award winner of the 2008 Academic Staff Regents Award for Excellence. Jamie Spencer has been integral in the growth and development of UW Lacrosse Alumni Association for the past 10 years. A graduate, graduate of UWL, Jane became executive director of the school's alumni association in 1998. In 10 years as the executive director, Jane worked to increase alumni association membership by over 400 percent and has overseen the creation of a number of programs, including the alumni travel program and the alumni ambassador program. She's also served on several committees, including the Multicultural Recruitment Committee and the Affirmative Action and Diversity Council. It was due to Jane's leadership and vision that our first Multicultural Alumni Advisory Board was formed. Jane also worked tirelessly to bring structure and prominence to the Multicultural Alumni Board. This award is given on an annual basis and is now part of UW Cross Distinguished Alumni Awards program. In addition to the advisory board and the Multicultural Alumni Award, Jane has worked very hard to bring diversity to the alumni and foundation boards, and she has reached out to current multicultural and diversity, diverse students at UWL as well. But Jane is not only a leader on campus, but she's a, a leader in the lacrosse community, and I can certainly attest to that. She has found a niche for service in, in the local community and tri-state area by her involvement as past president of Rotary International, former director of the Children's Miracle Network, Big Brother Big Sisters, and the Greater Lacrosse Area Commerce. Among the many achievements accomplished by Janie since she became executive director of the Alumni Association are, as I said, she increased membership over 400% and increased alumni association assets by 75%. She recruited an enthusiastic 34-member board of directors to advise the association. She established a volunteer committee to assist with recruitment of members of the marketing and member benefits. She developed new partnerships with Go Next, the Alumni Travel Program, the American Insurance Administrators for Short-Term Medical Insurance, and Liberty Mutual Insurance Company for Auto and Home Insurance. She's engaged in alumni and students in the life of the university with association-sponsored events, programs and events, and she's created new alumni clubs in places such as Tokyo and Taipei, in addition to the ROTC, residents of life staff, here alumni, and Silver Eagles. Jane has been recognized on our campus as an outstanding alumni through the Multicultural Alumni Award, Graph Distinguished Alumni Award, Lotta Distinguished Alumni Award, and the Athletic Wall Hall of Fame Award. I'll end my introduction by quoting Jane's personal philosophy. That is, quote, the Alumni Association creates a lifetime connection to UWL. These connections or relationships are the heart and soul of our program. The university needs our alums and their involvement today more than ever. We need our alums to provide internships and job opportunities for our students. We need them to support the campus financially. We need them to help recruit the best students. And we need them to speak positively about UW for class. So please let me introduce our first winner of the 2008 Academic Staff Award for Excellence, Jamie Smith. Good morning, everyone. 
everyone. Thank you very much for your wonderful introduction. Um, I'd certainly like to thank the Board of Regents and UW System for this wonderful award. I'm both honored and very humbled to be one of the 2008 recipients. I'd also like to congratulate Kathleen Janovich from UW Medicine and Beverly Phillips from UW Extension on their award as well. I'm very fortunate to serve as the Executive Director of the Alumni Association at UWL. I remember 11 years ago, I received a letter from the university sharing that the alumni director position was open. It gave a list of the duties, and as I read it, went through and I said, well, I can do that, I can do that, well, I'd really like to do that. Um, it really it felt like a good fit for me. Um, having an opportunity to connect alumni with each other and with the university really sounded like a position I was interested in. At the time, I was the director of the Children's Miracle Network at Gunderson Lutheran in La Crosse, and I remember asking a friend of mine, saying, what, can I, what kind of difference can I make at UWL? Making a difference was important to me. At CMN, I could see the direct correlation between the work I did and the children that we served, and I wanted to make a similar kind of difference at UWL. Lucky for me, I applied, I interviewed, and was selected for the position. Here I am, almost 11 years later, working at my alma mater, doing a job that I love, and hopefully making a difference. As Brent mentioned, the Alumni Association creates a lifetime connection to UWL. These connections really are the heart and soul of what we do, and I think no matter what campus you're on, um, you could attest to that. Their involvement is critical to the, to the growth and the uh, progress of the university. Um, they serve on volunteer boards and committees. They provide internships and job opportunities. They support our campaigns. They help recruit the best students um, to all of our campus, and they also serve as ambassadors for our institutions. Our alums make a huge difference um, in the life of the university, and I believe our future success depends upon them. When I think about who has been critical um, in my development as an academic staff member, three groups immediately come to mind. First of all, the Alumni Association Board of Directors. Throughout my career, I've managed many, many volunteer programs, um, but by far, this is the best group that I have ever worked with. We've assembled an all-star cast of loyal, committed alums who give not only of their time and their talent, but also their treasure to the institution. This special group of volunteers have not only mentored me, supported me, challenged me, but taught me more than I could ever have imagined. Um, professionally, I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for this wonderful group. The second group I'd like to acknowledge is my colleagues at the Clery Center. Ben says UWL, you know the Clery Alumni and Friends Center. The Advancement Division is, is housed in that building. Um, we're made up of three different units, the Alumni Association, the Foundation, and University Relations. The Clery Center crew, as we like to call ourselves, works very hard to advance the institution. We all have very different backgrounds and expertise, um, but I've learned so much from them, and I really appreciate what they've done. Finally, the most important group of all to me is my family and friends. I'm so blessed to have a wonderful family, and my husband Jim is with me today. I know he probably doesn't want to stand, but Jim is with me today. Um, thank you, honey, for your love and support. I wouldn't be here. I have met alums, young and old, in our own backyard in continents away. I have met famous and some not so famous alums, but the one thing we all have in common is our campus and that's UW La Crosse. Alumni and staff at UWL share an important bond. I'm sure other universities have something very similar, but being part of the La Crosse experience is truly something special. While my name may be on this plaque, it's my pleasure to accept this award on behalf of our board and the staff who work so hard to make UWL a great place for our students and our staff. So thank you for this wonderful award, and thank you for making a difference in my life. Good morning to all of you, and I would like to thank uh, Regent Bradley for um, assigning me to this committee. This was one of the most exciting things that I've done all year. And uh, you heard from uh, Regent Conley Keister about the, the basic criteria that, that we looked at as we made our choices. 
But I want to I want to bring two other ones to the table, and I'm sure that the regents who shared this and who reviewed these with me felt the same way. I noticed the connection between duty and joy, and I said them. And I also noticed that all of them wanted to change the world. I like that. I enjoyed reading them for that reason. And our second award winner of the 2008 Academic Staff Regents Award for Excellence is Kathleen Kelly Shanovic, pediatric nurse practitioner at UW Hospital and the UW Madison School of Medicine and Public Health. And as I read her credentials to you and you get to know her a little bit, I want to read something to you and I want you to think about her in the context of what I'm about to read. And this was a quote by John Wooden, a uh, college basketball coach, and he said, you cannot live a perfect day without doing something for someone who will never be able to repay you. Think about that as I read about Kathleen. Kathleen is a talented, creative, and energetic nurse practitioner who works tirelessly to enrich the lives of underserved children with asthma and to promote optimal care of childhood asthma in Madison and throughout the state. Kathleen has established an inpatient teaching program for asthma, as in the case with chronic diseases, preventive care is critical for controlling the day-to-day -day impairment and the risk of developing acute exacerbations of asthma. The asthma education plan for hospitalized students was formerly fragmented. The amount of quality of teaching depended on the admitting services, the degree of expertise of the ward nurse, etc. Kathleen designed and implemented a simple system for notification of asthma admissions to the hospital, followed by a comprehensive and standardized teaching program during the hospital stay. Over 40 children have benefited from this program since its inception. In addition to these activities, Kathleen runs a research program to investigate the effectiveness of a computer-based education program for low-income children at asthma, and it's called CHESS, and helps to recruit subjects for other uh, related studies at the UW Mad Madison system. In, are you tired yet? <laughs> In summary, Kathleen is an outstanding clinician, a children's advocate who has made a significant impact related to the care of children with allergies, allergic diseases, in the UW hospitals and clinics. When Kathleen joined the Pediatric Allergy and Asthma Program in 2002, she worked endlessly to bring about changes in the clinic, which resulted in better access for children, as well as an improved quality of visits for parents and their families. She made strategic changes in the clinic itself. What used to be a sterilized environment shared by adult patients, she changed into a comfortable atmosphere for children. Children rooms and artwork was updated to be child friendly. Toys were ordered for the children to play with during their stay. Many new educational materials included uh, research translated into Spanish to send a home with the families after their visit. She continued to spend hours updating the materials that are given to patients to provide the most current and patient-friendly information possible. Under Kathleen's direction, innovation, innovative programs have been developed to screen underserved populations of undiagnosed asthma and to improve the quality of emergency departments for the disease in Dane County. In the 
school-based asthma screening program, nurses, students, and respiratory therapists were screen have screened approximately 400 underserved children in the past year. Kathleen's personal philosophy is to choose to make a difference and the value of thinking outside the box. So I would like to quote a thought from Kathleen as she comes to accept this award. Community outreach are important lessons that are learned during many years of working in the Madison School. As a result, and recognizing the community's need related to asthma, I continue to strive for the best asthma care for children and adults who have limited or no access to the care. Again, you cannot live a perfect day without doing something for someone who can never repay you. It is my pleasure to introduce you to you, our second winner of the 2008 Academic Staff Leaders Award for Excellence, Kathleen Kelly who will change the world. <laughs> brought me to the University of Wisconsin in the role of a nurse practitioner caring for children and families through the Pediatric Allergy Program and as an asthma researcher in the Department of Industrial Engineering. In my role at UW and through the support of Freddie Adelson, Health Services Coordinator for the Madison Metropolitan School District, I continued my close ties with the Madison Schools and recognized the importance of meeting the needs of both children and adults with asthma in Dane County. Through the Dane County Asthma Coalition, which I formed and co-chair with my colleague Sally Zerbaldanich, we have established an emergency department asthma treatment program for all, all four hospitals in Dane County. I have also coordinated asthma screenings of children seen at the Dane County Neighborhood Child Health Clinic, where there has been an increase in identification of asthma in this at-risk population of children from under 4% before the screening to 10% since the screenings were started. I'm hoping to meet the asthma needs of these underserved children by establishing asthma clinics at UW Hospital with ongoing case management by school nurses in the Madison Metropolitan School District. Funding for these clinics will be partially supported by grants received from the Madison Rotary Foundation and Epic Systems. Of course, without salary and personnel support from a variety of sources, including American Family Children's Hospital, the Department of Pediatrics and the National Institutes of Health, I would not have seen my ideas put into action. None of these programs would be possible without the support of my family, colleagues, and friends. I would like to especially recognize my husband, Ron, <laughs> for always being there, and my children, Patrick, Ryan, and Kate, who have been role models of giving back to their community. It is often said by my friends that it takes a community to sustain Kathleen, and I would like to acknowledge some very important members of my community. My physician mentors and teachers, Jim Gern, who kindly nominated for me for this award, and Rob Lamanti, whose lack of limit setting has allowed me to think outside the box 
and see ideas turn into reality and see is right there. <laughs> Dr. David Gustafson, who's not able to be here, um, in industrial engineering, who encouraged my dream to include children living in the inner city of Milwaukee in chess for the comprehensive health and enhancement support system as a research study. My mother, Lucille, and my sisters, Pat, Mary, and Jamie, and Pat is right there in the white, um, with whom I have shared so much and have always been there to both listen and advise. My peers, who on more than one occasion could be found organizing and wrapping gifts for 20 families and over 50 children during the winter holidays in my basement, um, including Mary Kay, <laughs> Nan, who's on the end, Peggy, Freddie, and Beth, who couldn't be here. All of these women are not only incredible friends, but they truly are some of the most extraordinary nurses in the entire world. Um, I'd also like to thank the um, Childhood Origins of Asthma research staff, Lisa, Beth, Douglas, Kate, and Kathy, who have acted as translators, volunteered at asthma screenings, and made World Asthma Day a success for children in Dane County. They often wonder in what direction I will be taking them next. Members of the Dane County Asthma Coalition, especially my co-chair, Sally Zerbel Donish, physician Neil Jane, respiratory therapist Joan Lesupson, and Head Start nurse practitioner Mary Musso. And most importantly, I want to acknowledge all the children and their families in Madison, Milwaukee, who have taught me so much about the profession of nursing. Thank you very, very much. <laughs> everyone. As I was stepping out of the elevator this morning and I saw some uh, familiar faces, and then when I walked into this hall and saw more of my familiar faces, I got uh, momentarily a little bit confused, and I was wondering whether I was coming back to an extension uh, statewide meeting, uh, having come from the uh, my home base of extension and more particularly cooperative extension. And then I remembered that actually today was going to be a wonderful day because I have been given the opportunity to acknowledge and recognize the fine work of several of my colleagues. So it is my privilege to present the Academic Staff Regents Award for Program Excellence, which is being presented this year for the first time. And I'm very pleased that uh, my colleagues are the recipients of this first time award. The winner for the 2008 is a program that I have known well, and as a matter of fact, that is very dear and near to my heart. UW Extension's Wisconsin Nutrition Education Program, or the beginning of the alphabet soup, which ties in very nicely with the award, the WNEP program, is a major educational program within Cooperative Extension that is made up of two federally funded nutrition education programs for low-income residents. The Expanded Food and Nutrition Education Program, or EFNEP, and Food Stamp Nutrition Education, or FSNE, and one more time, WNEP, responds to the diverse needs and resources of limited income families by implementing community-based nutrition education programs in, are you ready for this? Unfortunately, in 64 Wisconsin counties, we have to provide this type of education. And it's sad to say there are probably more counties that need this, but 64 Wisconsin counties. Programming is made possible through partnerships among federal, state, and county governments, as well as more than 750 local community agencies in Wisconsin. More than 150 academic staff employees of UW Extension are funded through WNP to provide nutrition education programming to limited income families, children, and adults. Three quarters of the academic staff colleagues, and I am pleased to say my colleagues, 
who implement the WNP are instructional specialists. These colleagues who use the working title of nutrition educators work out of the extension county of the county extension offices to pre present workshops, series of lessons, home visits, and brief educational programs on a wide variety of nutrition, food safety, and budget food budgeting topics. For more than 20 years, WNEP academic staff colleagues have provided superior nutrition education programs furthering the Wisconsin idea. As a nation, we are alarmed with the growing incidence of overweight and obesity and the resulting personal and societal costs of these two incidents. WNEP nutrition educators work to combat obesity by attacking nutritional illiteracy among low-income populations. There is increasing evidence that people who run out of food or miss meals because they cannot afford them are at greater risk for being overweight or obese. WNEP reaches these high-risk individuals through well-tested lessons and activities taught in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion. During the past five years, WNEP colleagues have achieved, and this is very impressive, an average of 323,000 educational contacts each year. In 2006-2007 alone, the WNEP colleagues had made more than 317 educational contacts with diverse food stamp eligible individuals and families. WNEP educational programs assist Wisconsin families in acquiring new knowledge and skills and changing their attitudes and behaviors to improve their nutritional well-being. 25% of the program participants are parents of infants or children. 51% of the participants are school age youth. 11% were older adults and 6% were adults without children. And finally, 7% were preschool children. These are impressive numbers, but not necessarily some to be proud of. Learners are taught in school classrooms and, are, and at after-school programs, such as the Wisconsin Infants and Children's Clinics and Family Resource Centers, Senior Dining Sites and Food Pantries and other meal sites. WENP also works with the African American community, Hispanic Latinos, Asian American, Native Americans, and other learners in both urban and suburban and rural areas. Approximately 20 WENP educators are bilingual and offer classes in either Spanish or Hmong. One-fifth of WNEP staffers are from racially and or ethnically diverse backgrounds. Because WNEP educators live in the communities in which they work, there is typically a high level of trust between them and those they teach in their neighborhoods or as I would prefer to say, in those barrios. WNEP has, reached, has received state and national recognition for teaching and program excellence. WNEP staff have, has been tapped by the U.S. Department of Agriculture, one more alphabet soup, USDA, Cooperative State Research Education and Extension Services to provide national direction to initiatives surrounding program management and documentation of impacts and curriculum development. With the rapidly rising cost of food, the academic staff in this program play an active and critical role in helping to build local community capacity to address hunger and food insecurity. The USDA Food and Nutrition Services has stated the work of Wisconsin staff has resulted in strengthening national dialogue and understanding. WENP makes a difference in the lives of their participants by extension and extension in the quality of their life and in their communities. And I have seen that firsthand. It is a great pleasure for me to introduce a colleague of mine, Beverly Phillips, State Coordinator for the WNP, who is here today to receive the award on behalf of the program. Beverly? Good morning. My name is Doug Phillips, and I am the state 
coordinator for our nutrition education program, also known as WNEP. So on behalf of more than 150 of my colleagues who are around the state, I want to thank the Board of Regents for the 2008 Regents Academic Staff Award for Program Excellence. We truly appreciate the honor and recognition for our educational program. The Wisconsin Nutrition Education Program provides the knowledge and the skills and just the information and the motivation to help low to bit income learners learn about nutrition, about handling their food safely, about stretching their food dollars to make it through the month. We have programming currently in 64 of our 72 counties. And as Jose said, um, we really wish we could put ourselves out of business and be nowhere. We strive to help learners change attitudes and behaviors to improve nutritional well-being. In 2006-2007, Wisconsin Nutrition Education Program's community-based nutrition educators made more than 317,000 educational contacts in our communities. Most of our learners are food stamp eligible families and individuals, children. Our program does make a difference in the lives of our participants, and we document that through our program evaluation. For example, 86% of the learners in six urban counties who participated in a series of nutrition lessons reported that they had improved their daily diet as a direct result of the lessons in which they participated. The program is so successful because of the trust-based relationships created within our communities by our educators. The academic staff that deliver our programs are so special because of their deep understanding of and respect for the cultural differences. My colleagues work with African Americans, Hispanic Latino residents, Asian Americans, Native Americans, and other learners in urban, suburban, and rural areas of Wisconsin. Twenty of our academic staff educators are bilingual and one-fifth are racially or ethnically diverse. Acknowledging the work of all WNEP academic staff is really what this award is about. So I have with me today some colleagues, a few of our educators, our county coordinators and specialists. First of all, I'd like to introduce Kazuo Moa. Kazuo, can you stand? Thank you. Kazua is a nutrition educator from Dane County. Kazua represents our 110 nutrition educators who are the heart and soul of this program. Nutrition educators teach hand washing to Head Start preschoolers, teach a fruit and vegetable lesson in a fifth grade classroom, talk to men at a job training center about the importance of whole grains, and teach safe food handling while playing food safety bingo with senior adults, sometimes all on the same day. Next, Tanya Evans. Tanya Evans is a nutrition program coordinator from Racine and Kenosha counties. She's here representing our approximately 40 county coordinators who do a wonderful job of leading our local county-based programs. And Shelly King Curry. She is a nutrition program specialist. She represents our state-based specialists who do a great job of supporting the work of all of our colleagues around the state. Also with me are Lori Boyce, Family Living Programs Director, Yvonne Horton, Cooperative Extension Associate Dean and Associate Director, and Richard Clement, Cooperative Extension Interim Dean and Director. I applaud them and thank them for being here with you. program is the research-based network in which we deliver it. We really do value being part of the university system and it is a big part of our strength and our success. Our educators draw on the expertise of specialists within the UW system, a true partner of excellence. In conclusion, WNEP nutrition education truly makes a difference in the lives of many of our less fortunate residents. Our nutrition educators are effective and very passionate about this work. As we continue to reach more learners, to further develop our teaching and outreach skills, 
and strive to meet the nutrition education needs of our growing minority populations in Wisconsin, we will carry in our hearts the pride of receiving this prestigious award. Thank you. Thank you, Regent Conley Keesler and the other regents on the award committee, and uh, congratulations to all our award winners, and keep up the good work. Uh, the uh, award to WNEP reminded me that when I was uh, Chancellor of Extension, I had the privilege of visiting one of the WNEP sites where uh, uh, I got there, as I recall, at the mid-morning snack time for the preschool program. So I got bustled in and they sat me down at a very low table. And, down like that, and the kids were around and one, uh, you know, one girl was sort of dipping into her orange juice and spraying it across the table. Uh, another boy was, uh, was picking the blackberries out of the blackberry muffin and flicking them. <laughs> Little, little girl was trying to stick her finger in the ear of the boy sitting next to her. It was just great. It was, it was a wonderful, <laughs> wonderful experience, and I kept wondering why I felt so comfortable. And then when I, when I got back to Extension, I realized the atmosphere was just like that of an Extension Chancellor's Cabinet meeting. <laughs> so I see uh, uh, Chancellor uh, uh, David has left, and uh, I don't know if he's cleaned that up since uh, Extension. But it's a wonderful program, as are uh, all of the programs that our award winners are involved in. We appreciate it. Um, I wanted to, uh, to go on to talk a little bit about something that we've been working uh, hard on in system administration for quite a while. This is the uh, first ever, ever or, or will be if it gets approved, the first ever formal mission statement for the University of Wisconsin system administration. Um, I think this is important for us. One of the there are always surprises when you come into a new job, and one of the surprises for me coming into this job uh, several years ago uh, was after a year or so in, and I looked around at a cabinet meeting uh, at system administration and said, well, you know, what do we have in the way of, an, of a mission statement? And we at each other, and we found out we didn't have one. Uh, so we, we went to work uh, first in system administration and, and then uh, consulting widely with, uh, with others across the system about uh, about what kind of a, of a formal mission statement we, we might have. We've worked on this really over the past several years, put a lot of thought into it, uh, and uh, we wanted to bring it back to you at this point for consideration. You might remember that back in September of 07, I uh, initially uh, put it in your packets and we had a very brief look at it, but uh, we wanted to wait till we had gone through the Advantage Wisconsin strategic planning process, had developed uh, the now 11 goals we have for the growth agenda that you're aware of, and uh, Senior Vice President uh, Rebecca Martin will give you an update on where we are in each of those goals in a few minutes, uh, but we wanted to go through that process. Uh, after we consulted widely with uh, chancellors and provosts and uh, faculty reps from around the system, academic staff reps from around the system, and then student leaders, uh, I mentioned meeting with them on Wednesday, and I have given them now a copy of the, the draft that you have in front of you, told them the board would be considering this today for the first time uh, uh, for a discussion, and then we bring it back in October for a vote, we hope, and uh, uh, ask them to take a look and provide us with any thoughts or reactions they had. So uh, having gone through that consultation, we did want to come back after the uh, strategic plan was done and say now that we've got uh, a pretty good clear assignment in those 11 action steps, what's the mission of the system administration in, in carrying that, uh, that out? Um, a couple thoughts on the substance of this and how we put it together. Uh, there is a statute, an official mission statement for the University of Wisconsin system. 
the system as a whole, and you have that in the attachment uh, to my cover memo and then to the proposed system administration mission statement. It's attachment B, and, and the mission of the University of Wisconsin system is stated there by, uh, stated there from the Wisconsin state statutes. And there is also a statement on the role of the UW System Board of Regents, also in the statutes, uh, and you have a statement there adopted uh, from that. As you know, I think, each of our 15 institutions in the UW system has its own select mission, uh, and you see those periodically if a, uh, a, a one of our universities comes forward for a change in mission. Uh, we thought our goal here was to fit in a system administration mission between uh, the statement on the mission of the system as a whole, the mission of the Board of Regents, and then the individual missions of each of our, each of our institutions to, to try to figure out uh, how the system administration should be adding value in that mix. So the, uh, the draft you see before you for a system administration mission statement has a core uh, statement at, at the center which reads with the Board of Regents, the UW System Administration leads and serves the UW System Institutions as a champion of higher education and a responsible steward of resources. Um, again, the question here is how do we add value in doing that? Uh, the, the attachment A piece that is the draft system administration mission statement uh, lines out a number of particular functions that we believe we do perform, we should be performing in the way of adding value uh, with the target being fulfilling that mission statement. Uh, we also have a vision statement, which again is at the bottom of attachment B in the materials you have, and that's that's really the, the kind of aspirational vision that you've heard me say and repeat multiple times over the last several years, that the university would be Wisconsin's premier developer of advanced human potential of the jobs that employ that potential and of the communities that sustain it. I think the system administration mission statement is one way to try to realize that vision. What is it that system administration should do to help the system, to help our campuses and extension, to help the board realize that, that broader vision? So uh, we've been looking forward to this uh, uh, discussion with you today about uh, what we've put forward as the system administration mission statement. Uh, certainly are, uh, are open to having uh, chancellors and provosts and other colleagues join in if, if the board would like. But with that, President Bradbitt, I'd uh, turn it back over for an open discussion and suggestions on what you have in front of you in the way of a, of a, of a mission statement for the folks in the system who I would say really are the staff of the Board of Regents. Uh, the, the, what this board wants to get done in the UW-Wisconsin system in the state really depends in very large part on the uh, efficiency and commitment and direction we provide to UW system administration staff in getting that done. I think this is an important statement for the board, for us in system administration, for our chancellors and provosts as well. Uh, any questions or any <clears throat> discussion? But not all at once. <laughs> well, I'll take that as a, a sign of approval for the good work. And I know you've spent a lot of time on this, and this has uh, this is not the first draft, shall we say. Right. It, it is not. It's been worked over uh, <clears throat> pretty extensively. I agree with the lack of discussion. Points to the fact that you have a good job on this. Well, good. Uh, would you like a, a motion to adopt it? Uh, well, if, if the board is comfortable right now, it seems to me we could just go ahead and, and do that. You know, let's change it. <laughs> yes, yes, we can. <laughs> Okay, it's been um, moved to adopt the system uh, mission statement. Is there a second? Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. Thank you very, very much. Uh, now we uh, do want to provide, as I mentioned earlier, a uh, one of our regular updates. Uh, we'll be doing this at each board meeting on the growth agenda action steps 
Uh, Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs, Rebecca Martin, has really been leading uh, that activity across the action steps. Uh, uh, our VP for Finance, Deb Durkin, has been working specifically on the uh, uh, business efficiencies one with Rebecca and Rebecca's back is going on, on just about all the other ones. So she wanted to give you an update on the, on the work, and I want to thank her for this work uh, uh, that's, that's complicated. We have involved and want to keep involved uh, representatives from uh, all our institutions, so this isn't just something that system administration is doing, because if that's what happens, we won't get the steps actually done. So uh, with that, uh, Rebecca. and assessment of existing campus programs for adult learners and focus groups with students, admissions officers, directors, student affairs officers, provosts, registrars, and others to identify policy barriers that inhibit college degree attainment. The proposal for the four-year project with MOA funding, which we hope we will um, be awarded, will target populations of opportunity, including adults, people of color, and veterans. And we believe, although we know the specifics of this will come out of the work we're doing with focus groups over the course of this coming year, areas under consideration that we, we expect will emerge from those conversations include prior learning assessment, credit repository, and online programs. And then the last I'd like to highlight today is number nine, operational excellence. And I understand that the Business Finance and Audit Committee heard a report on this activity at their meeting yesterday. And so I would turn to Regent Smith and ask him for his comment. We did receive an update on the activities of the operational excellence working group that you mentioned. The working group has developed plans based on the administrative process for designing project credit and what you do in Madison for a series of evaluation projects and employment the principles of lean manufacturing. These principles concentrate on speed, efficiency, and eliminating waste, which we can find in space and non-value added activities. Um, the first three processes to be considered under this initiative include the procurement card process, non payable payments for services made to individuals, and the travel expense reimbursement process. The procurement card process is currently underway at four of our institutions, Blackville, Lodge, Gosh, River Falls, and Superior. The results of this evaluation effort should be shared with all UW institutions as a way of sharing best practices and encouraging more students. 
streamlined and simplified and standardized processes. The operational excellence working group also suggested taking greater advantage of UW system expertise by making greater use of faculty and staff who present at outside conferences by bringing that expertise to colleagues throughout the UW system. Uh, the funding presentation program and establishing a UW system innovation and efficiency award program, which would offer incentives for staff to prepare proposals for professional organization awards for, for providing modest incentive funding. Uh, we heard from representatives of UW Madison and Oshkosh about the activities on their campuses in this regard, and we concluded that there certainly seems to be uh, momentum across our system on changing and improving practices to make, uh, make them more efficient. Thank you. I'd just like to close by thanking um, the provost for their ongoing leadership in framing up what, what I think is a very ambitious agenda and moving it forward in a way that we hope to have tangible results to report to you over the course of the coming year. I'd be happy to answer questions about any of the other action steps if you have them. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you for your good work. And, uh, you know, one of the dangers uh, uh, you have with a strategic plan is that it gets done and then it's done. It sits there on the shelf and we say, we, we've done it, now we can move on. I, I want you to understand we're not doing that with a strategic plan. And you'll hear uh, every meeting the progress we're making for actually implementing the action steps that the plan came up with. Uh, let me just uh, share a few uh, uh, positive developments that are coming out of our institutions with, with the board. Uh, we've all been uh, somewhat transfixed by the Olympics, I'm sure, and as they draw to an end this week, I want to announce that one of our very own UW athletes will be heading to Beijing in just a few weeks to, complete, to compete in the 2008 Paralympics. UW Whitewater senior Matt Scott has been chosen to be a member of the U.S. National Wheelchair Basketball Team. And we're not uh, the only ones who recognize Matt's talent. Men in, in the athletic industry have begun to take note as well. He was nominated for a 2008 Excellence in Sports Performance Yearly Award, better known as the ESPY, for Best Male Athlete with a Disability. And earlier this year, he starred in Nike's No Excuses TV commercial. So on behalf of the UW system, I want to wish him good luck as he represents the USA and the UW and UW Whitewater in Beijing. Uh, I, I also want to congratulate the UW Eau Claire women's softball team for claiming the NCAA Division III championship in an all-Wisconsin final with a come-from-behind victory over UW Whitewater. <laughs> the softball team's national title is the 17th title in UW Eau Claire's athletic history, but only the second since joining the NCAA. So congratulations to Chancellor Levin Sankevich and the Team Blue Gold. It sounds like it was a pretty close game, by the way. I understand that if it had gotten any closer, Chancellor Levin Sankevich and Chancellor Telfer were going to have to arm wrestle for the title. And Brian Dick has a pretty good football team uh, on his side, so you have to be careful. Uh, UW Stevens Point has achieved uh, an exciting milestone as well. Its campus residence halls now use 53% green energy from renewable resources. The university has been purchasing WPS NatureWise Green Energy, a voluntary energy program offering green renewable electricity from a mixture of local wind turbines that use waste biogas from landfills and from farms. Stevens Point is the largest purchaser of renewable energy of all the UW system campuses, making it one step closer to being completely dependent on renewable energy resources by its target date of 2012. So good for Chancellor Bennell and her colleagues at UW Stevens Point. The UW South community recently held its 2008 visioning session to begin work on setting new institutional goals. A group of 85 members of the public offered suggestions and ideas to be considered in the university's strategic planning process. The last visioning session was held in 2001, and the goals identified were included in South's focus 2010 plan. This recent session will help to lay out a series of goals called Focus 2015 to be accomplished by that year. So we look forward to hearing what comes out of that strategic planning process. Chancellor Sorensen, and good luck to you and your colleagues. On it. Uh, that staff visioning session is just one of the many examples of UW institutions engaging in meaningful dialogue with Wisconsin communities. In fact, UW Manitowoc recently addressed the needs of its community and students when they signed an agreement with Silver Lake College and Mount Mary College to ease the transfer process for students. 
Under this collaboration, students with an associate's degree from UW-Manitowoc and at least a 2.0 grade point average will be eligible to fully transfer their credits for admission to the two private four-year institutions. Although uh, Chancellor Shepard and his wife Cindy are no longer with us here in Wisconsin, the future Phoenix program they helped establish at UW-Green Bay has seen exciting growth this summer. Local philanthropist Irene Daniel Kress made the first leadership gift in a generous but undisclosed amount toward the $5 million scholarship fund for that program. Her gift will help to kickstart an ongoing endowment fund that will award scholarships to participants in the program who intend to enroll at UW Green Bay. There are also five other new endowed scholarships earmarked for that program. The growth of the Future Phoenix program and others like it bodes very well, I think, for achieving our growth agenda action steps of creating a know-how-to-go network and doubling the amount of private need-based financial aid we distribute across the system. Uh, finally, with all the attention to, uh, to China in connection with the Olympics, I want to take a minute to recognize the 15 current and retired UW Oshkosh faculty members who traveled to China for two weeks this summer to learn more about Chinese business education and practice. During their trip, they were able to visit a number of businesses and two universities in Shanghai and to see firsthand the unique issues facing the Chinese education system. UW Oshkosh's College of Business hopes to pursue a cooperative agreement with the city's Hangzhou Foreign Language School to arrange admittance of five students per year to UW Oshkosh's business program. Uh, but I'm sure I don't need to remind any of you that in this global knowledge economy, it's becoming increasingly important to extend our handshake across the globe, perhaps especially to the large emerging economies in Asia. So thank you to Chancellor Wells and the Oshkosh team for helping us do that. Finally, Mr. President, I wanted to, uh, to just give a special nod to several members of, of this board. And if I could just ask them to stand for a moment for, for this, this recognition. Regent Drew? Would you please stand, Regent Falvo, Regent Pruitt, Regent Vasquez, and Regent Womack, would you please stand? Uh, a number of you probably heard that recently Marie Claire magazine dubbed the city of Milwaukee its sexiest city. <laughs> stand, it's standing. So, I just thought we should all recognize what a really sexy group of Milwaukee area regents look like. In the words of uh, Billy Crystal's Russian aunt, you look marvelous. Don't forget, uh, don't forget Mike and Danae. I know, they're not here. Just, they were just the ones who were here. We want to recognize them, too. Mike Spector and Danae Davis. I, I should tell you, President Bradley, that after I read that Milwaukee had been designated the sexiest city, and it's a really good thing, good thing for Milwaukee. I called uh, or emailed Chancellor Santiago saying, well, does this mean now that you're the sexiest chancellor? <laughs> so he responded very, very humbly that uh, with the competition he has in the current Chancellor Cadre, he couldn't possibly claim that title. <laughs> <laughs> and speaking of uh, a looking marvelous, I wanted to recognize it today as Regent King's birthday. <laughs> Regent history. Certainly. And my birthday. Um, thank you all. It's, uh, I happen to know that back in the 1950s, there was one of the first female regents with Helen Connor Laird, who was the daughter of W.D. Connor, one of the great lumber pioneers of the North Woods. And um, Helen spent a great deal of time on Birch Lake, which is very close to Silver Lake, where I spent a great deal of time in the summer. Helen was one of the first women graduates of UW Madison. And Helen shares this birthday with me. Oh, and she's also the grandmother of First Lady, Lady Jessica Weird. Thank you for that piece of history. And with that, uh, President Bradley, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, President Riley. So one, one member of the board asked me, he said, do you know what Kevin is going to say when you have these meetings? And I think this morning is proof. I have no idea. <laughs> Okay, ladies and gentlemen, if we could uh, 
return to our agenda. The next item is our consideration of the biennial operating and capital budgets. We had a, a detailed presentation by President Riley yesterday on both operating and the, and the capital budgets. I, th I mentioned before that I think it's very important that budgets speak to what the institution is all about. I think this one does. Um, I think if you, there are two pages in the materials that are going to allow me to speak about this budget very easily. One of them is the page that we do every year that takes this huge number that policymakers see, this $4.7 billion number, which, which dwarfs so many other numbers that they see when they're looking at, at state agencies, and gets you down to the bottom of the page and says that you, you really need to forget about a lot of those um, dollars in that $4.7 billion and get down to the $1.8 that we use for educating roughly 170,000 students in this state. And when you break down that 1.8, you see that the students and families in their tuition are sharing the, the larger part in that breakdown between them and the taxpayers. The other sheet that I think is very is going to make it easy to talk about what we're trying to do is page B1, this uh, schedule that breaks down our initiatives by campus. And I think it's very important to uh, point out to people as you're, either you're talking or advocating about our budget that we're trying to do three things, as Kevin explained yesterday. We're trying to grow the people, grow the jobs, and grow the communities. But all of our campuses aren't uniformly engaged in all of those activities. If you look at those initiatives, we have seven campuses and institutions because the colleges and extension are participating with some campuses. So we have seven institutions working on the growing the people part, increasing the baccalaureate degrees in, in the state of Wisconsin. And we have a different mixture of roughly seven institutions, if you again look at what extension and colleges are doing, in the growing the jobs part with the workforce development initiatives. And then in the growing the communities part, we have two campuses that have, are coming in on that category saying, this is what we're able to do best for the state of Wisconsin in 2009, 2011. It reflects the, the diversity, it reflects the different uh, talents of our institutions, and it reflects that the different regions of the state have different needs. And I think it shows that our institutions are responding to those regional needs by coming at this in very different ways. I think it's going to be relatively easy to talk about, um, again, asking the state of Wisconsin to invest, increase the investment in higher education. And that's an easy conversation to have because no matter where you look, inside the university community, outside the university community, every one of our economic summits, everyone who is writing about what our prosperous states doing, what our prosperous country is doing, the bottom line for all of them, the commonality is they're increasing their investment and they're working very hard to be productive in doing it in higher education. We're able to talk about a very nice increased investment in our last biennial budget with the legislature back 90-some percent of our request in the growth agenda for Wisconsin, and the governor did also. We're coming again for what I call growth agenda two and asking for additional investment. And while we're asking for that, we can proudly point out the productivity that we have accomplished in being recognized throughout the country as one of the more efficient large systems in higher education. So I think we have a lot to talk about in advocating for our students going into this next biennium. You have in your materials a resolution. It is uh, 25A, and to get any additional discussion on the operating budget, I would ask for if there is a motion to approve resolution 25A. Is there a second? Moved and seconded. Any discussion, any questions on the operating budget? Regent Connolly Keyes. I just have one question. In the event we aren't able to obtain the entire $37 million in the GPR, the additional money that we're asking 
money that we would need for growth agenda. We will be able to come back and readjust the budget, right? There isn't an assumption that, that tuition is going to make up whatever we don't get from 37 million. True? That's correct. I mean, I think if we don't get what we're asking for and we're going to have to advocate very hard as we did last time to get it, we'll have to come back and reconsider what we got and how we uh, use that. David? The one percent question is um, kind of what percent for uh, that is in here on page uh, three to help. Six over six million. Three over six million. Any other questions or uh, discussion? The rules of thumb are on page E13 in your materials. All in, I'm sorry. Um, all in favor of the motion, say aye. Aye. All opposed? Thank you. The motion carries. Next, we turn to a resolution to approve the capital budget request. Is there a motion for approval of item 25B? Is there a second? Moved and seconded. Any discussion on the capital budget request? All in favor of the motion, say aye. Aye. All opposed? That motion carries. Next, I'll ask Regent Bartell to present the report from the Capital Planning and Budget Committee. Thank you, Mr. President. So the Capital Planning and Budget Committee uh, met yesterday uh, in a room directly under this one with windows all the way along the wall. And we are very grateful to Judy for arranging that. Very nice. If you'd like to go back there again. <laughs> Um, we approved our minutes from the July special meeting of our committee, and the following resolutions were unanimously approved by our committee, and I present them as a single uh, motion. Resolution 1.3.B, uh, which has been referred to here this morning, uh, requests authority to adjust the project scope and budget and construct the UW Madison Chazen Museum of Art project. It's a $47 million project, <laughs> including $46.9 million gift funds, almost entirely gift funded. It will provide a new building to display and store works of art and extend the development of the East Campus. This is an item that is an example of the what we referred to yesterday as the dysfunctional uh, capital budget uh, planning procedures. It, uh, uh, the Elvium, which is now the Chazen uh, project, was originally uh, conceived and recommended uh, four years ago and eventually enumerated as part of the 2005-2007 capital budget in a process that uh, uh, is now not nearly over. And that was before any of the designs and cost estimates were uh, prepared and before any architect even looked at the project. It's to be funded entirely with gifts, as I mentioned, and is primarily from Simona and Jerry Chasen. And now that the design work has been completed, and we have a much better idea what the cost will be, we need to take it through the process again. I'm just hopeful that the Chasen's will still be around um, at the time that it's built and scheduled to open in 2011. Um, we need to fix some of this. Anyway, that's resolution 1.3.B. Resolution 1.3.C authorizes construction of phase one of the facilities management relocation project at UW Oshkosh to remodel vehicle maintenance facility and storage buildings that were transferred to the university this May. This project is estimated to cost about 475,000 all gift funds. Uh, resolution 1.3.D requests approval to construct phase one of Babel Hall remodeling project at Platteville. This is a $2.2 million project which will remodel classrooms and construct biology science labs and address certain infrastructure deficiencies. More than two-thirds of the cost is to be funded with uh, program re revenue supported borrowing, including some from the Tri-State Initiative. Resolution 1.3.E authorizes construction of the Steiner Residence 
uh, hall renovation project. It's the second of four planned residence hall renovations at UW Stevens Point. It's a $5 million project which will provide uh, elevator, replace windows, upgrade mechanicals, and so forth. The cost of these improvements uh, also comes from program revenue support borrowing. Uh, the debt service on the bonds will be paid from dorm room rentals, which are estimated to increase uh, by $273 uh, a year, which is uh, approximately $3,000 a year for, for those residents. A total of uh, res uh, resolution 1.3.F requests approval of 12 minor projects under the All Agency Maintenance Fund Program. Two of these projects are UW Madison Energy Conservation Projects that are funded with program revenue uh, that is to be repaid, and this is really interesting, by energy savings through fuel and utility account. These projects will save the university almost $100,000 per month, can you believe that, in utility costs, and they have a five-year payback. Most of the other projects in this all agency category have a significant uh, gift funding component to them. So these are the five resolutions that were passed unanimously by the committee, and I move uh, their adoption uh, as a consent uh, agenda. Thank you. Is there a second in the motion? Second. And second. Uh, any requests to remove an item from the consent agenda? Not all in favor of the motion say aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. Mr. President, the committee met briefly in closed session to consider the naming of the facility at UW Madison, which we will take up in closed session here later, and the our meeting of the Senator. Good. Thank you very much. I'd now ask uh, Regent Crane to present the report of the Education Committee. I'm privileged to offer the Education Committee report today in the absence of Chair Danae Davis and the Vice Chair uh, Mike Spector, both of whom are at a meeting uh, uh, um, focusing on education in Milwaukee today, so uh, they are at a, a very good place. And I am pleased to offer it. Um, and I will be giving a summary of the meeting and then dealing with a couple of uh, resolutions uh, as I, within the body of that summary and then a con consent agenda at the end. I want to um, indicate up front, however, that although I'll be offering a couple of um, resolutions separately from the uh, consent <coughs> agenda, that all of our resolutions come with a unanimous vote. But because of the discussion at this meeting and previous ones, we thought that we ought to offer those separately. I, uh, we began yesterday by, uh, uh, with a presentation from uh, UW Plattville's campus uh, academic plan by Provost Carol Sue Butts. This was a, uh, just a fine report and one of a series that we have been uh, hearing from uh, various campuses and has given us a much greater understanding of the, uh, the academic goals of each institution and also uh, um, a good deal of pride in what we are seeing accomplished. We then went to a discussion of a UW Stout uh, program authorization of a BS in computer engineering. We did unanimously approve uh, this proposal and the resolution will be presented uh, with the consent agenda. We had this presented in a helpful context by Senior Vice President uh, Martin. And just to remind you of some of those factors, last April we heard the, uh, a presentation about from the UW System Engineering Education Task Force, which issued a set of recommendations for conditions under which new engineering programs could be proposed. Those recommendations included regional need, utilizing existing resources, collaborating with other institutions. <laughs> we also uh, received uh, yesterday abundant documentation attesting to the regional demand for this program. Provost Julie uh, First Volvi detailed other aspects of the program which spoke to alignment with the report's other recommendations, that is collaborative relationships with UW-Eau Claire, Wisconsin Technical College institutions including CVTC, and emerging collaboration with UW-Platteville. 
The program is working to increase the student pipeline for engineering with a focus on women and students of color, uh, beginning with middle school, middle school summer programs, and we know how important those goals are. The program builds on existing resources along with the growth agenda funding received in the 07-09 budget. We believe that the computer engineering program aligns well with South's mission and polytechnic designation, and that will be presented as a consent agenda uh, proposal. We then went to discuss the Wisconsin Technical College um, approval of associate of degree of science degree liberal arts transfer program in collaboration with UW La Crosse. The presentation uh, from the Technical College Liberal Arts, uh, relating to the Technical College Liberal Arts program is in collaboration with UW La Crosse, and it began early in our meeting with a visit, uh, which has already been mentioned uh, in, uh, by another speaker with uh, Assembly Speaker uh, Mike Kipsch, who was strongly supportive of this proposal, and we were very pleased to hear from him, and uh, it was a worthy ad addition to our agenda. Um, senior, and he expressed uh, appreciation to the leadership of both, of both faculties at Western and at UW La Crosse for making this degree come to fruition, noting that the real winners were the students seeking baccalaureate degrees and the state seeking a brighter economic future. Senior Vice President Martin made it clear that neither the UW system nor WTCS uh, intends at this time to bring any additional liberal arts transfer degree programs, uh, in, so none of those are currently in the pipeline. Uh, the Western Technical College proposal uses the Chippewa Valley Technical College program that we, improve, that we approved in March of 07 as a model. And it, is, and it adheres faithfully to the criteria for such programs that were approved by this board in February of 07, which I believe is in your folders. We learned that the Western program has followed a deeply collaborative process with faculty from both Western and Lacrosse working together uh, to develop a program that drew upon the strengths of both institutions. And Western's president, uh, President Lee Raj and Chancellor Joe Gao both spoke eloquently of the great work done by their faculties, but refused to give us a musical rendition. That <laughs> understanding that both of these people are fully capable of it. This program is very focused on serving students in lacrosse, and I will uh, put forth a, a resolution um, in, in, that, in that fashion. We are assured that it will not compete with other one plus one agreements between the UW colleges and Western Technical College campuses in Boston and Viroqua, and that it has a demonstrated interest in serving high school students in lacrosse. 40% of whom end up at Western. Uh, the committee, within the context of this, also received a brief update on the chip of the Valley Technical College UW Eau Claire Liberal Arts Transfer Program. It's barely a year uh, of data that is available, but the program appears to be meeting its goals and valuable lessons uh, they say have already been learned. Enrollment targets have been exceeded, and there is a strong expression of interest in the program by students entering CBTC. The interest has been so strong in that Claire now sends its entire academic advising staff to participate in CBTC's transfer orientation program. With that background, I would like to now uh, uh, put forward agenda item number 11C. Uh, do you wish me to read that resolution? Uh, I believe everybody has a copy of the resolution. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's been moved. Is there a second to that motion? Okay. Any discussion? Questions of the committee members? Uh, all in favor of that motion, say aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. We then went into a discussion of um, the charter school contract extension. And two of, uh, one of those, uh, uh, one, of the, one of those extensions will be presented on the uh, consent agenda and the other two will be presented on the uh, separate resolutions, again because of the uh, conversation that uh, was involved and, um, it, it, both yesterday and, in the, and previously. 
Um, the first uh, resolution that I will mention will be the one that will be on the uh, consent agenda. And that deals with the Woodland School, which uh, presented um, its uh, uh, report. And there were, in fact, with all of these schools, um, staff and board members present who were very enthusiastic about their program. Uh, the Woodland School did not, we did, uh, the committee did not have any uh, issues with the Woodland School. It uh, was uh, affirmed and was supportive of its goals. And we do are proposing a five year renewal of that contract and again that will be part of the uh, uh, consent agenda. The other two schools, the uh, Capital West Academy and the Business and Economics Academy of Milwaukee, sometimes referred to as BEAM, were uh, identified in a letter that I think all uh, regions received previously from the uh, Department of Public Instruction as making as not making one of the schools not making adequate yearly progress. Uh, that, that's referred to as AYP uh, periodically, and that's defined in the in the No Child Left Behind um, bit, uh, Act and legislation. This is the first time that those two schools did not meet AYP and. There are no, uh, so there are no sanctions the first year, but there was, we felt that this was a, a, an item that um, at least that there were issues that we should have um, serious discussion about. We did have considerable discussion and Regent Burmaster was uh, with us for, uh, for I think all of the, of the time that we were discussing that. We also heard from uh, Dr. Bob Catman, the director of the Office of Charter Schools who um, briefed us on not only on what was going on in those schools but also the challenges that, um, that, that they face. After a good deal of uh, deliberation um, and seeking of information, the committee decided to um, amend the two resolutions that had uh, been sent out previously that would uh, clearly spell out the uh, conditions under which the contracts of each would be renewed and the terms under which um, uh, they would uh, then um, be operating. And there were several people at our meeting, uh, and including uh, Regent Burmaster, Regent Spector, and Carlos Chen, who uh, helped us um, with, uh, with reaching the final uh, um, proposed resolution. The, intent, uh, the intention was to both give, to give each of the two schools the opportunity to turn around the student performance and make AYP in the following year but also ensure that to ensure that the educational needs of the students and their families uh, were being met. The revised resolutions are in your folder uh, or in your, your, your uh, binder this morning. They are 11D2 and 11D3. And before moving their adoption, uh, I would uh, uh, draw to your attention the dates that are enumerated in each of them since this became the uh, linchpin that, uh, upon which the approval was, uh, was um, uh, agreed upon. And I should note that while the resolutions provide the necessary accountability for these schools as seen by the commission, the committee in relation to AYP, that they do not preclude future contract extensions should either school um, improve and uh, their achievement in the AYP standards and come before us uh, at, at, at a future time. But we also did agree that uh, we will make those couple of points clear in the minutes of, of uh, the Education Committee meeting and presumably this meeting as well. With that background, I would um, move both um, uh, 11D3, is that the right one? Am I looking at the right one? That's one of them. 11D2, and 11D3, I got it. Okay. And, and if everybody, make sure you're looking at the revised one. That yeah, has be the sure to be looking in your folder this morning. Okay. Is there a second to that motion? Discussion? Okay. Any discussion? If not, all in favor of the motion say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. 
And finally, uh, we did uh, hear what was uh, turned out to be an abbreviated report from Vice President uh, Martin. Um, we went a long time yesterday. We, we barely made it to the picnic. <laughs> Um, but uh, it did include um, the annual academic program planning and review report that was uh, given by, actually given by uh, Vice President uh, Ron Singer, and we do recognize uh, his service uh, not only to the entire board, but especially to our committee, and we are very grateful for that. Uh, we heard uh, an update on the UW Colleges planning, um, which, in, uh, which came from uh, Chancellor Wilson's recommendations uh, heard by the board last March. And as you recall, one of those recommendations uh, was to seek authority to offer an interdisciplinary baccalaureate degree in applied arts and, sci and sciences. And she reported that an entitlement, entitlement to plan working group chaired by UW College's interim provost, Provost Greg Lampy, is working on drafting a document, and that will be uh, shared with the provost uh, early this fall. Uh, Vice President Martin also uh, clarified a question that had been raised by the board earlier when we discussed this um, uh, relating to uh, whether um, the ability to, for the UW colleges to offer a restricted baccalaureate degree would require a change in state statutes, and the answer to that is no. Uh, but this, this is in process, and is still in the process of discussion and will be presented to us um, later on. She also uh, provided an update on chapters 17 and 18. Revisions are being made to these two new chapters of the Wisconsin Administrative Code on student non-academic disciplinary procedures and conduct on university lands. Following an extensive period of consultation with a variety of constituents, a set of proposed draft rules will be sent out to us in early September giving us ample time to review and understand um, what we know are important issues. And we'll be asked to act, um, uh, act on those later. And then they will be sent to the Legislative Council for its review process. The goal is to have those rules in place by academic year 2009. And then now, at this point, I would like to offer the consent agenda. Resolution 11B, authorizing the implementation of the BS in computer engineering at Stout. Resolution 11B1, approving the extension of UW Milwaukee's charter school contract with the Woodland School. Resolution 11F2, approving the appointment of Valerie J. Gilchrist to the UW School of Medicine and Public Health Oversight and Honor and Advisory Committee of the Wisconsin Partnership Program. Resolution 11 one F3, authorizing the implementation of the Bachelor of Legal Studies at UW Clair. Resolution 11F4, authorizing implementation of the bachelor's degree in early childhood education at UW River Salt Hall. And Resolution 11F5, authorizing implementation of the MS in clinical investigation at UW Madison. Is there a second to that motion? Moved and seconded. Any discussion? Excuse me. Any? Uh, is there a request to remove any item from the consent agenda? Okay. All in favor of the motion, say aye. Aye. All opposed. Thank you. Motion carries. And next, I. I'm sorry. Yes. Uh, I was unable to make the meeting, uh, the two hour meeting on the free charter schools, uh, but in the last four years that I've been here, uh, it certainly seems that uh, every time the charter school is on the agenda, uh, it is a bit of uh, arm wrestling uh, with the board. Uh, we do have a, uh, I think, very strong uh, equivalent to superintendent, Bob Catman. I think the school does a good job in monitoring and supervising uh, these schools. Um, and it does create difficulties for us to run in the 11th hour uh, some of the initial discussions, which is your right to change those contractual arrangements. Uh, one of those initial discussions uh, are different from what the, the conversation has preceded them. I would ask the board two things. Uh, uh, first, uh, 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 I would ask the support of our process, not necessarily our outcomes. If you disagree with the proposals that we provide, simply vote them down. And I, I would respect that, uh, uh, that uh, support or not support for those proposals. The second is I uh, would, was 
like to see the board have a serious discussion about the future of charter schools and our role in it. Uh, I think that's at the, at the heart of, of many of these discussions. Uh, I personally believe uh, that uh, our charter schools are good schools. Uh, they are at this point. Uh, if you look at Bob's role, he is the equivalent of a superintendent. He's a school district of about 10,000 students, much larger than many in the state of Wisconsin. Small in terms of uh, Milwaukee's population, however. Um, I uh, support what we've been doing. It's a, uh, a mandate that was given to the institution long before I arrived. Uh, I've come to appreciate the difficulty of improving our urban schools. I cannot imagine the job that uh, uh, Regent Burmaster has in that responsibility on a statewide level. Uh, I think we are contributing to improving K-12 uh, education. I would hate to see uh, our role diminished uh, in, in the city in terms of that support, but we are prepared if this board decides that we should not be in that business, we are prepared to provide a plan and invest ourselves with those charter schools, transition them to other charter agencies, and uh, support this public school. Thank you, okay. Chancellor Santiago. Could I, could I, could I just make one? Uh, I appreciate the hearing from from Carlos uh, on this matter. And uh, I, uh, first of all, I I, I want to make it clear, and I other committee members can can respond if they wish to. Uh, the desire of the committee was not to vote them down, and I um, I hope that. Um, I would that is right. And secondly, I would support his uh, his suggestion that um, that this is a fundamental problem that we need to deal with. Okay. Thank you. No, Regent Smith. Thank you, President Bradley. Along with the Education Committee, our Business Finance and Committee heard from Dean Golden, of course, and many of you were there about the Wisconsin Partnership. Uh, and over, most, most of you were there, and that's going in great depth, but we heard about the number of grants, the amount of money that uh, is being spent on those grants and the purposes of them. Um, he's going to be back in December. We're going to hear a five-year plan to the Board of Regents in December. I think what created the most discussion as we went around the room for an extended discussion was the scorecard that he had uh, presented, as well as some of the statistics that he presented, and uh, uh, disparate results, uh, for example, in the in the area of infant death. So while the grants and uh, very good discussion, I think what I saw as we went around the, the, the table at the end of the at the end of the, his presentation was a discussion of that uh, scorecard and about some of the, the statistics that he had uh, presented. Uh, committee heard two or three different uh, three different reports on trust funds uh, uh, yesterday afternoon. Um, we discussed the UW system trust fund spending policy in relation to, to proposals on mandatory spending rates by Congress. And you've heard a lot about that in the last year. Uh, Congress is, is um, at least threatening to get involved in the, in that uh, in that process and we reviewed the earnings and assumptions and how they relate to our spending plan. We talked uh, about uh, an update on trust fund's private equity investment program, which began in 2002. The information we got was that the trust fund's private equity program has been successful. Uh, we heard from representatives from Adam Street Partners of Chicago. They provided uh, more background on their firm and addressed the importance of diversification, again looking at that uh, private equity component. Um, we heard a report from Julie Gordon, who I know is with us this morning, on three different uh, audits, uh, one new and two uh, updated, and which took probably the majority of our discussion in, the, in our committee. One, the first one was the UW Mental Health Counseling Services, which has, I think, uh, been discussed a lot. Look forward to what the audit was, and um, uh, very timely for a number of reasons, including some of the work that Regent Bartell and others have been doing uh, with regards to security issues. Um, the review noted that all of our four-year institutions offer a variety of mental health services and that all two-year colleges will within the next year. Uh, it's really noted that the number of students seeking services has increased, but that the number of professional staff has not. Um, there is certainly challenges in just sustaining mental health services, as you saw from that report, and some of the solutions may be best developed at the institution level. I think the response and this, this point that we got from uh, Debbie and, and President Riley was there too, was that the President's Advisory Committee on Health, Safety, and Campus Security will be asked to facilitate the review of the audit recommendations and develop guidelines to assist the institutions. 
I think it may be the conclusion of this report, if anybody has any comments or questions, because I think that's one of the most important audits we've had recently, and uh, the implications of it and, and the importance of it. And if you have it, questions or comments at the end, would certainly be, uh, be welcome. Um, two previous reports update on student credit card debt and credit card solicitation on our property. UW property and also on the health and safety training for UW employees. I think on the one we've seen a great deal of progress on the credit card solicitation. Uh, most campuses have restricted credit card solicitation on campus and I think that's something we urged when it came before us uh, recently. So there's been a, a good deal of progress on that. On the other hand, we were somewhat disappointed obviously in the, if you read the, res the report on occupational health and safety training. Uh, this was an audit that had been previous that had been done in 2004. And uh, quite frankly, if you read it, the, the review noted very limited progress by our institutions in implementing previous audit recommendations. Uh, we're quite insistent that we want to get an update with recommendations and how those are going to be implemented uh, at our December meeting uh, in La Crosse. And I think there was a clear signal from our committee that we wanted to uh, see work done on that. And uh, we recognize resources can be uh, scarce on that at times, but we wanted to see some further progress because clearly that audit indicated there's still a lot of work uh, to be done in that area. Um, we should talk some committee business on future uh, meetings, goals of our committee. I think one thing you might all be interested in, one of the topics that we wanted to start is the look at is the committee, the finance committee, but more important, the region's financial oversight role and determining uh, what type of financial information currently exists that may help support the region's and this committee's role and how the committee can best support and be involved in audit recommendations. We want to look at how other public institutions, what, how their regions or trustees provide this level of oversight. And uh, we already gave some direction yesterday as to how we want that to proceed. We'll come back to our committee and uh, we'll come back, of course, to this entire board at a, at a later date. We heard from Vice President Yerkin on a number of matters, including the university's share of the state budget shortfall, which will be a lapse of $25 million. Um, we heard the diligent campus plan, including holding vacancies open later and reducing energy consumption, will assist in managing that lapse. We also heard from uh, Debbie on the recent flooding and boiler losses. Flooding at the four institutions and the boiler loss at UW Whitewater are estimated at 10 to $12 million, the largest loss in UW history. Uh, the Business Finance and Education, education Committees unanimously approved the following resolution, which I'll now present as a consent item. On behalf of uh, Business Finance and Audit, I move the adoption of Resolution 1 to A, and that's the Wisconsin Partnership Program 2007 Annual Report. Is there a second? Moved and seconded. Uh, there is only one item. If you remove that, folks, we're really in trouble. Uh, all in favor of the motion, say aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. That concludes the business of the committee, but again, I would be interested in any questions or comments uh, other regions have with most of the audit items or anything else on our. Um, uh, I, I just like to take care. I, I read the report in particular on, on counseling services, and, and I found it to be a, a very troubling report. Uh, I think our I think our institutions are doing their absolute dead level best in terms of providing these services. It's not in any way a reflection on their efforts or their their energy in trying to make do. But this strike me, struck me, and I was interested if the committee had any conversations. This seemed to me to be one of these casualties of this. Uh, effort to cut administ quote unquote administrative expenses. Uh, and, you know, you cannot look around uh, this country these days where you see, you know, reports about the percentage of students who contemplate suicide, binge drinking, Virginia Tech, all the other things, to see that the challenges that are being faced on the campuses and for us to not have a proactive sense of urgency to figure out what what we can be doing and what we can do to help the campuses and what it's clearly a resource issue in terms of in terms of whether or not students need to be involved and student fees need to be involved so we need to involve students in a variety of things but I don't know about others and I don't know what I'd, I'd be interested in what conversations you had at the committee but it, it seems to me that that this was a pretty pretty uh, strong way to play. Yeah, I agree with at least my reaction was that it was a way to go on. 
uh, many challenging and troubling parts of that report. And I think that sense of urgency was there that others on the committee don't have to speak to it. But, and I think we'd be interested in getting this back in front of us for the report recommendations, what's being done as soon as possible. Uh, and I don't know how we can do that, Kevin, but I, I, I certainly think from our committee's point of view, and Chuck said it well too, we just can't put this aside. Yeah. Yeah. We have, we've spent more time on this yeah. particular audit than any other audit. I, I also have a lot of heartburn around this audit and spent quite a bit of time talking to staff about it before we um, came yesterday. But, but I think you know part of that discussion has to happen is how deep do we want to go into counseling? How deep do we want to go into referral? And how does that process work? That just discussion never really happens, and I don't know who's going to have that discussion. Is this the committee that's going to have that discussion? Is this our committee who starts to kind of determine that? Because with that comes cost. And if we're going to get into this, and maybe we should, then we need to do it right, and we need to have the resources available. So is, is that where your committee is starting? Or? Yes, uh, in response to really both what uh, all well, well, three regents have just said, and I'll ask Tom or Debbie to correct me if I'm wrong or bad, but, you know, the conclusion to this audit, uh, specifically says that uh, the Board of Regents System Administration, Campus Administration could consider taking action in three areas. The first of which is delineating the extent of the UW system's role in counseling services. So uh, the President's Advisory Committee, I will ask to take up that and the other two uh, suggested items, and, and that's the, the top one on the list. And I think you, you put your finger on a core question here. I mean, from my own point of view, it seems clear that we cannot and probably should not, given our mission, provide all the services that, that some students need. The, the question is recognizing that some students do need more than we can provide. How do we arrange to get that for them? And then how do we stay in touch with the providers of those services so we know that our students are in a situation where they're not a threat to themselves or others? I don't know the answer to those questions, but we're going to ask the committee to try to take that up and, along with the other two charges and come back to us and then to this board with some uh, answers or suggestions along those lines. Just, can I just follow up, Kevin, just, just out of curiosity, how do we how do we get at these resources? I mean, at this issue of resources, because they're clearly, I mean, is that sort of part of the charter of, of the conversation that you're envisioning, or is, is there a sort of a broader region? Role that, that that should be played here in terms of in terms of the resource question. Because I cannot imagine, based on reading this report, that part of what people are going to appropriately come back for with is to say these are some of the needs we have, but there is you know there's some real resource challenges. Well, again, I think the the suggestions from the audit open up those questions for us to look at. Again, uh, suggest that we look at delineating the extent of the UW system's role in counseling services, exploring additional sources of financial support for counseling services, and maximizing the use of, use of existing counseling resources. So as in uh, many other areas, resources are at at the center of what we will be able to do. And I think, again, in this one, recognizing that we can't do everything with the current resources we have. How do we cooperate with other agencies and entities to do that? But you're putting your finger reaching for it again on a larger question. Should be should we be even though we recognize we can't and probably shouldn't be doing everything in this area that every student needs, nonetheless should we still be asking for some additional resources to help us do what we decide through this discussion we'll have we ought to be doing and we need to do ourselves. But led to the question too as to whether and as we're looking at a budget and the past systems going forward, but do we put a specific line, let's say in the next budget we look at for counseling services, right? Just as we did this time for the library, right? Right. And we're, we're the while. Do we have a specific line item for counseling? I think we can't answer that question, no, Regent Smith, until we answer the prior question of what should we be doing in counseling and what should others be doing. No, I understand. Yeah. Any other discussion? I just had one question, uh, Brent, on our spending rate. What is our current spend out? Five. Five. And last year it was four point something? Was it about four point? Four, what would four, but we had with you? Yeah. 
the entire, but reality is sports are probably going to go to the program for whatever scholarships or whatever we're giving money for. But for our purposes, five, it's actually five percent is being spent out of those endowments. Correct, correct. Combination or right. spends plus what actually goes out. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Any other questions for Regent Smith? Okay, thank you. The next item on the agenda is consideration of our 2009 meeting schedule. The proposed schedule that you have accomplishes a, a couple of things. First of all, it uh, provides two of those um, uh, big issue opportunities. And if you divide a day into two subjects, that gives us an opportunity to uh, tackle four big subjects. and. Uh, Chancellor Santiago just uh, made a recommendation <laughs> so that we, we filled at least the third one. Uh, the other thing that this does is, uh, in, re in response to requests from regents, is it gets us out to more campuses. If you look at the schedule, uh, we would be on hosted by, by this campus, also UW-Milwaukee again, and UW-Whitewater, UW-Eau Claire. A uh, third thing, uh, and again in response to uh, requests from regents, you'll notice that our annual meeting in June will be on the Madison campus rather than at UW-Milwaukee. We never get to see UW-Milwaukee when the students are there. So we're, we're doing a switch and the uh, June, excuse me, the, the May meeting would be hosted by UW-Milwaukee, and the students will still be there in the early part of May, and then we'll have our annual meeting on this campus. I've uh, been moved. Is there a second to the motion? Yeah. Discussion. Uh, which date is, uh, are we having this uh, deep dive uh, discussion? We will have the first deep dive. I'm not sure I'd be happy. Well, yeah. November of this schedule is when we're going to have the two subjects that I discussed earlier. For next year? For next year, the, we're, we'll do that on March 5th. Don't miss it. And also <laughs> on July 9th. Pardon? So, Frank Bradley, are we now at four meetings in Madison, a Milwaukee, a uh, two or White Water, Eau Claire, and what is the eighth then? Four Madison, Milwaukee, either Milwaukee, next year, two, or five White Water, five Madison. Five Madison. Correct. So we have eight, eight meetings, six two days, two one days. Regent Craig. Uh, yesterday, I think you said, Mark, that um, you heard from some regions who liking this change. And have you heard from anyone, either from, from the campuses or the system, that something isn't working about this? No, to the contrary. Uh, like the fewer uh, the, well, at the campus level, I've heard people say that they appreciate the opportunity to host the regions. Um, I would. I think it's fair to say that. The people who have to take care of us and get us ready to go on a campus outside of the city of Madison appreciate um, the fact that, I mean, the, those visits on other campuses are fine, but um, remember last year we talked about they spend um, essentially all month getting ready for us for another meeting and it's like a full-time job, whether we're here or on other campuses. It's just a very taxing on the staff. A, a reduced staff, I would point out. I mean, there are fewer people able to prepare for regent meetings and take care of everything. You know, as Kevin said, the UW system staff is essentially ours. There are fewer people doing more work, just like um, is existing on our campuses. So I think, would you comment that this is more favorable? Yes, and I, you know, I, um, I have not heard any region say to me that they don't like this system, and a few of you have comments that have said this seems to be working pretty well. I know from conversations with the chancellors and provosts and others, they certainly uh, prefer uh, this arrangement. And I'll link it directly back to comments, compliments, really, that President Bradley gave us and a couple of the rest of you have on this budget presentation. Part of the reason we were able, I think, to 
uh, lay things out as clearly with some substance and carefully as, as we did in ways that, uh, that are understandable on a huge, complex topic like our operating in capital budgets was because we had time to concentrate on that rather than always playing catch up about the arrangements for the, the next meeting or debriefing from the one that just happened. So I think, I mean, I honestly believe, and I know at some level this is self-serving, but I honestly believe you are better served as a board giving us the time to do what we were able to do at this meeting than having a meeting every month. Any other discussion on the proposal? There is a resolution if someone who wants to make a motion to approve our schedule. Oh, I'm sorry. That's right. It's been moved, seconded. We're on discussion. Any other discussion? Thanks, Michael. Uh, all in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. Uh, any other communications, petitions, or memorials? Any unfinished or additional business? If not, I would uh, see if we could take a, a recess until uh, noon, and then we'll reconvene and entertain a motion to go into closed session. I think we should have David put down that.